Uh, welcome to the free energy workshop for businesses here. Uh, very happy to have you guys all here uh, to talk about energy this morning. Um, my name is Jeff Packard. I co-chair the energy action team with Jennifer Pujer, who's very sorry she couldn't make it this morning. Um, but uh, we're going to have a great talk this morning with uh, our panelists up here. And I'd like to introduce Neil Allen, who's the executive director of the Greater Portland Council of Governments, uh, for a, a few words before we get started. Thank you, Jeff, and welcome all. It's a terrific turnout. And uh, Jennifer sends her apologies. She had an emergency situation that she had to deal with. Uh, she's one of our, our real rock star staff members. For those of you who have worked with her, I think you probably agree. But as Jeff said, she is the co-chair of what we call our energy action team. And let me just give you a quick overview of what that is. Uh, two or three years ago, we initiated a an economic development process called Mobilize Maine. Uh, it's regionally based, it's asset based, in other words, what are our strengths as a region that we can uh, take advantage of and hopefully continue to build uh, the economy in, in southern Maine. Jennifer's played a key role in that effort and has co-chaired our energy uh, action team, which has really done a lot of great things. It's a good mix of public and private sector folks, which has been one of our long-term objectives to really try to bring in the private sector and the response from people like you has really been terrific. So we're really happy to be here uh, hosting, I think we've done two or three other similar workshops uh, over the last year or two. Uh, Jeff will lead the program. We've got an exciting program. I do want to uh, thank and acknowledge the, uh, the town of Raymond for hosting this event and helping to support the event, and in particular, Don Willard, the town manager, and his assistant, Danielle Loring, the assistant manager, have been super to work with, as, as always. I uh, want to recognize Mike Reynolds, who is sitting in the back there, and uh, he's the uh, chair of the Raymond Town Council, and he's also active uh, with the Greater Portland Council of Governments on our executive committee, and is a former president of GPCOG and has provided some terrific uh, regional leadership. Uh, so I'm going to stop there and uh, just say that, again, we're very pleased to have all of you folks here. Uh, we're live, so be careful what you say. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for those of you who may need uh, a little restroom, I, my understanding is if you go through that door, you'll find it somewhere in the back there. So uh, anyway, thank you all for being here and looking forward to a great program. Thank you, Neil. Uh, so I think we'll just jump right into it. Our first speaker uh, today is Rick Meinking with Efficiency Maine. Uh, and we have his presentation ready to go. Sounds good. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks for having Efficiency Maine here uh, this morning. Uh, lots of things to talk about, uh, but primarily, let's talk about what uh, Efficiency Maine can do with the Maine <coughs> businesses. Um, my name's Rick Meinking, and I do manage the business programs for the Efficiency Maine Trust. Um, can I use this, sorry? A little bit of something about us that, for those that don't know us, um, I like to open up by throwing out two key terms, this, this idea of energy conservation and energy efficiency, and is there a difference? And I'd like to uh, suggest that there could be, <coughs> and there probably should be, because I think everybody in this room can do energy conservation today, and it won't cost a cent. <coughs> And it's a good thing to do. And an example of that is possibly turning off a light switch when you don't need a light on. Or hanging your uh, clothes on a nice windy summer day when we ever get sun out here um, instead of using your electric clothes dryer. Uh, you could take one trip and do multiple errands to save on your, your gas. So those are examples of things that you can do today that won't cost you anything. Uh, and I said, if, if I could ever be you know, the, the ruler of Maine for a day, I'd give everybody a t-shirt that says, just turn it off. And I think we could save a lot of energy. So that's energy conservation. 
Then we talk about energy efficiency, and that is where you have to purchase something. You physically have to buy something and then install it that will use less energy than what you're replacing. A good example of that is taking out a 60 watt incandescent light bulb and putting in one of those fancy new LED screw-ins. It's going to use less energy, you had to buy it, and you had to install it. So that's energy efficiency. And that's our gig. That's what we try to get main businesses to do. We want you to take out that bad light fixture and replace it with a new energy efficient light fixture. We want you to take that <coughs> boiler that runs at 84% on a good day and put in a 92% efficient boiler. And Efficiency Main is here to provide some resources to do that. What are, so in essence, what we are is Maine's uh, energy efficient utility. We are actually going to help you enjoy energy savings, and we get in return, we get to buy that energy savings from you. And then we can bid it into other, other funding sources like the forward capacity market and meet our obligations there where we could get some funding to continue to run our programs. So we're building this generator, if you will, this generator of savings, and uh, what we're spending on that saved energy is about three cents to the kilowatt hour, and you're purchasing that at about seven cents, and then you're also paying about six cents to get it there. So we are the lowest cost utility in Maine, and uh, we are funded through a variety of sources, one of them being on everybody's electric bill, there is a what they call a system benefit charge or an energy efficiency procurement charge. That's the new kind of buzzword. So uh, that's, that's a little bit about us. And then when I was saying that we're going to get you to put in that new light fixture, we realized that you may not have the technical uh, uh, expertise, so we can provide some of that for you. Uh, we can also uh, do some quality assurance to ensure that that equipment that is being um, installed is going to uh, indeed save you the, uh, the electricity it says it's going to do. And we provide spot checks on projects just to make sure that uh, our uh, contractor network that's uh, the backbone of the business programs is out there putting in the good stuff. We really want the good stuff installed. And then finally, it's all about the money. And it's, uh, uh, you know, something that Efficiency Maine does on, a, on an annual basis based on our budget. We provide uh, financial, uh, in the business side, I like to use the word incentive. We're going to provide some incentive for you to go ahead and put that new light fixture in. So that's what we do and what we offer. We offer the ability for all business types in Maine, whether you are a profit, for-profit or a non-profit, uh, anything with a non-residential component is considered a business. Uh, a lot of times I'm asked, well, what about a hotel? Well, a hotel is really transient housing, if you will, so it's not a primary resident for anybody, so it falls under a business. Uh, Pretty much any building that you don't have your, the, the address on your driver's license is not also the address where you put your head down at night. Uh, so if you're not in that situation, it's a business. And what do we do for businesses? We have the easiest way to, to uh, participate with us is through our prescriptive pathway. I call it the, the plug and play. You put this in and we'll give you this. It's predetermined, we've already vetted the energy savings on the equipment, and it essentially says, put it in and you will receive an incentive for doing that. Now, a lot of times I'm asked, how are we set up and how do we, how do we provide incentives and, and what's the, the criteria for that? So I just wanna go over two key uh, incentive structures that we have. One of them's a retrofit. And a retrofit is simply saying that we want you to take out that perfectly good light fixture. It's functioning fine. It gives you the light where you need it, but it also uses a lot of energy. And we want you to put in a new light fixture. 
that uses less energy and does the same thing in, in, in terms of making sure you can see what you want to see. Recognizing that, we provide an incentive to cover the total project cost. So you're talking about your materials and the labor to do the installation. Now when we talk about a lost opportunity or a new construction project or a replace on burnout, what we're saying is you are going to have to purchase that boiler, all right? You're building a new building or your boiler is dead, no longer puts out heat. You have to buy a new one. What we're gonna try to do is get you to buy the most efficient one and recognizing there's an incremental cost between one that you're replacing to the more efficient one. It's like, uh, it's like that health food. Uh, the, the less calories, the more money it costs. Uh, you're getting less, but you're paying more. Well, we realize that the better piece of equipment is going to be more money than that baseline. And so we're gonna provide an incentive to cover that incremental delta. So we're not gonna worry about the labor because you have to do this anyway. So what we do is we cover that incremental cost between the good piece of equipment and the bad piece that is burned out or you're, or, or you're doing a new building. Everybody understand that concept? So that's how we develop our incentives. Now we also, and, and the, the measures that I, I should have gone back here, let's see, is that it? That's it. When I talk about the prescriptive pathway and uh, we're looking at technologies like lighting, uh, HVAC, we have heat pump incentives, we have compressed air if you have a gas station and have lifts, uh, and you have small processes, uh, VFDs, uh, those things, you know, make a motor use less energy when it doesn't need to run at full bore during a peak uh, water transfer time. So all of these little end use technologies, we've vetted certain pieces of equipment and will provide incentives through the prescriptive pathway. Additionally, in the prescriptive side, we have natural gas incentives. So we're saying take that bad atmospheric boiler out that runs at 80, 85 percent and put in a non-condensing boiler that's running at 98 percent efficient. We provide incentives for those. Right now those incentives are for the Unitel natural <coughs> gas area and I know Raymond's probably uh, got very little of that natural gas but uh, for those that have businesses outside of, of this geographic area we do provide natural gas incentives. We have custom projects. These are for projects that we don't know specific savings based on the equipment you're proposing to put in. And so there's a little more uh, engineering work that needs to be done by your contractor and we kind of vet that equipment. And if it's determined to provide energy savings, we'll want to put some incentive dollars so you will move forward. Now, a caveat to all of our, our uh, incentives, we're not gonna give you money unless the project is cost effective and it provides verifiable energy savings. Prescriptive, we've already done that verification for you. On the custom side, your contractor has to make that case for that uh, project to move forward, both on the natural gas side and on the electric savings we provide this pathway. For those that are in large uh, businesses, the 400 KW, I think there's like 150 of them in the state of Maine, we provide some additional support for those, uh, those businesses. Uh, a lot of that stuff gets involved into the aspects of what's going on inside the building. We pretty much have a prescriptive pathway for everything that the building itself needs. HVAC, lighting, ventilation, all of those end uses. But when, when you talk about some businesses here in Maine, they have some special things going on inside. And so we provide some additional support for those that are using a lot of energy, like the paper mills and the, uh, <coughs> Texas Instruments. And, and Can you tell us what IDEX is that? IDEX is pretty big too, sure, yeah. I thought you guys also had some. Yeah, yeah. We did. All right, now there's probably some uh, folks
folks out there that know that the business incentive program right now uh, has uh, suspended its measures. The reason why is a wonderful story. We've had a highly successful year this year, higher uh, participation than what we had thought. Uh, just been a huge win for the business uh, programs here in, in uh, at Efficiency Maine. And we live in a world where we have finite budgets. And then when budgets are used, we no longer have funds to give out. That's a great thing when we can say that we've expended all of the funds that you've entrusted us with. And we have done that. We have exceeded our goal for this year. We're on track to save over 51,000 megawatt hours of electricity on the business programs themselves. Now, what does that represent? Uh, if you take the blended rate of about 13 cents a kilowatt hour and you multiply it by that amount of savings, that's $6.6 .6 million of annual savings that the projects completed this year have accomplished. So over the lifetime of those measures, we're talking $85 million. So for the next 13 years, all the projects that were done this year are gonna save $6.6 .6 million each year. That's a huge success. It's unfortunate that this success has happened so rapidly that we couldn't get through the entire budget year without running out of funds. Um, that is the reason why. It has nothing to do with anything that's been in the newspaper about uh, any PUC ruling or anything like that. It's purely based on uh, an unprecedented uh, period of activity in the business programs. Um, and I, you know, it's because of our contractor network out there that is working with their customers, you folks, and getting these projects accomplished through the business incentive program. So it's been a huge win when our funding sources are back in the bank account and we can open these programs up. The sooner the better, I know, and we will do that. Uh, but right now, as you can see on this slide, we do have natural gas um, funds left. We have some all fuel prescriptive pathways. These are fairly new. These are like your O2, um, your oxy oxy oxygen trim kits for fuel oil boilers, programmable thermostats for all types of heating sources. And uh, those funds are still available as with the uh, custom natural gas uh, track. So if you find yourself looking at any of those, super, we can still work with you. If you're looking for other electric savings and heat pumps, stay tuned. We will make a, an announcement once those programs uh, have the funding in the bank account and we can roll them back out. I know that you have agricultural equipment. We do. What exactly? I'm seeing retrofit and new construction. Yeah, we uh, actually have some uh, equipment that we vetted like uh, milk uh, heat exchangers. So you can use some uh, waste heat to pre-warm some milk through the process. We have uh, VFDs for these very large fans and potato warehouses, for example. Uh, we have some uh, explosion-proof lighting <laughs> for some of these applications where uh, the agricultural uh, community has asked for those. So there's some specific end uses that are geared strictly for that area. So are you working with the... Uh, we're, there's a big surge right now for indoor growing in the state of Maine. Oh, yeah. And so a lot of farmers are expanding into that. Are you helping out with any Well, <coughs> that's a great that question. One of the, uh, the question was about indoor lighting for some of these grow lights. Um, one of the reasons for our, our, our huge success this year mm -hmm. is this LED market. It has really exploded. When we started this program year, just to give you a perspective, there was about 59,000 products available for the consumers in the LED world. In about eight months, that grew to over 90,000 products. Uh, so number one, there is a large number of products available. The other thing that happened was the increase in manufacturers. We're up to almost 1,040 manufacturers around the country that make that 90,000 
uh, products. What happens when you have lots of manufacturers competing for a certain market share? It's going gonna, it's gonna to affect prices, and it's going to cause the prices to go down significantly. That's what we saw. And uh, we had to make some tweaks in our incentives uh, earlier on, and folks really jumped on the LED lights. Uh, it's a great energy saver. <coughs> Grow lights fall into that. We don't right now have a specific measure for grow lights. We'll have to wait for how the marijuana bills pan out. You know, and maybe we'll have to have grow lights. I don't know. But um, certainly that technology is maturing. Uh, so I think in time there might be a specific need for that type of measure. But right now we don't offer that. It can be done through our custom track. Now, you know, the lot, you're seeing hoop houses. Mm -hmm. Not just in the marijuana market, but yeah. Like well, I was just throwing out the grow lights because that's out, a big thing. We'll be like Colorado; it won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be our right, right. But anyway, yeah. The additional funding dependent on the fiscal year, or that's fiscal correct. Year? We run on a fiscal year, so one July. <laughs> we one July. we and and right now the board of trustees is uh, we're going through our budget process right now. So we're determining which programs and the funding levels for those programs. Uh, that's going to have to be all accomplished by 1 July. And so we'll know uh, approximately what's our budget going to look like here in another month or so. Do you think the and will be uh, added back in? I'm going to stay out of that conversation. I was going to say that too. <laughs> well, if it isn't, then what's the effect of this? Uh, right now, uh, the effect of the and has nothing to do about next year will have no effect on our funding sources for next year. What it does affect is our FY 17, 18, and 19. And we're going to be engaging the stakeholders, and, and that's the contractors, that's you folks, and those are other interested parties. As we develop, Efficiency Maine wants to develop our next three-year plan. That three-year plan's budget is predicated on some of that kind of stuff. Yes, sir. The, the uh, number oh, after yeah. after this question, if we could just hold the questions until after the presentation, that would be. Fine. I was just going to ask about the uh, fifty-one thousand <coughs> megawatt savings. Is that over the life of thirteen years, or what is it? The savings per year? Did you think of the that? the savings per year is that fifty-one thousand per year? Per year, okay. and that's six point six over the life. Right. And when you do a retrofit lighting, right. for example, that has a measure life or right. a shelf life right. of thirteen years. Right. The reason I bring that up is. If you look at a nuclear <coughs> power plant, that's about 1,000 megawatts. Mm. So that would be 51 uh, nuclear power plants that don't have to be built, which is the reason why energy efficiency folks to the fourth capacity mark of ISO New England, because you're decreasing the need of the capacity of generating plants. Sure. Yep. So I just thought I'd throw up yep. another big, you're in business to reduce the energy usage of Maine, so that's why we don't have to build as many power plants. It's a lot cheaper to, to let us build our generator of savings than for you all to actually have to kick in and build another okay, uh, that's generator. A good point. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yep. Actually, uh, I, the last part of what I wanted to say is we have, I was mentioning about our contractors, and they are the backbone of our, of our program. And so we'd like our customers to come in the door to play in our programs through their contractors. Some may already have existing relationships with an electrician or an HVAC technician, mm -hmm. and we want to encourage that. We're hoping those technicians and electricians are qualified partners. If they're not, we'll get them to be one. But your way into the door, businesses' way into the door, is through the qualified partner network. And if you don't know about them, uh, they're going to be the ones that uh, actually will sell the energy efficient equipment and they'll be the ones that install them and sometimes they can be both and then we have engineering firms and architectural firms involved with us and we have energy service companies like ESCOs and auditors and folks like that that can help you uh, develop projects so how do you get to them we call them qualified partners <coughs> by the way and that's their own branded uh, logo we have a locator on the Efficiency Main website. You can see down here, There's, you can set a zip code and a radius, and you can select what end use you'd like to find. 
and it'll spit out a list of those qualified partners that meet the criteria that you selected, and then you can contact them directly. And that's your door in. That's the way businesses can get in. And then the qualified partners are supported by the program team that will make sure that they have the tools they need to deliver the, the low cost energy resource called energy efficiency. So that's really our gig in our game. And if you ever lose your way, that 1866 number is a main base call center that will get you in touch with whatever you need to do. And uh, if you're like me and like to do a lot of emails, our email address is right there as well. And uh, we'll get back to you. Uh, that email actually goes to the call center and they will forward that email to the proper uh, team. So that's, uh, that's us. Uh, again, thanks for having Efficiency Maine here today, this morning, and uh, I think I yield the balance of my time to uh, Fred. Fred. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So thank you very much. For You're this. welcome. Um, and if you guys can save questions just until after uh, Fred has finished speaking about energy efficiency, that way we can have all of the, uh, those questions at that time. So Fred, if you want to actually just jump you over here. you want to switch places or do you want to run my presentation? Why don't you sit over here? Okay, all right. I'll, <laughs> I'll slide down. down. While I'm doing that, Perfect. I'll just uh, want to say thank you to the Greater Portland Council of Governments for inviting us. I have a little brochure about my company. The name of the company is Spark Applied Efficiency. And I'll just pass that around here. Maybe you guys can read what I'm all about while I'm speaking. Again, my name is Fred Warch. Thank you. When I have a sheet here, these are uh, just a case study for a client uh, of ours. We did a restaurant project, so I'll hand that out as well. Here, I'll take one and pass that along. All right, thanks. All right. So again, thank you all for coming this morning. Um, my name is Fred Warch, and uh, I'm the co-founder of Spark Applied Efficiency. And I've got a little presentation for you. This is the first time I've ever given this. So if there's any rough edges, I apologize. And uh, I guess we're holding questions to the end. Is that yeah, something to do? Yeah, great. All right, great. So uh, Rick had just mentioned that uh, the Efficiency Main Program has qualified partners. These are contractors who do the work. And we are one of those qualified partners. Um, so what we do is we do consulting, we do design, we do procurement, uh, buy the equipment, and we also install the equipment. We're licensed electricians, and then we hire other people as we need onto our team. So we, we work with uh, engineers and plumbers, whatever it takes to do the job. Um, so what we're trying to do for you as a qualified partner, as an efficiency company, is we're trying to help you achieve greater profits. That's most people are in business for that reason, and we're here to help you. Uh, we can also help you uh, achieve higher performance. A lot of times we'll go into a place like this. For example, this room, is there any way we can turn <coughs> off the, uh, the overhead fluorescence? And just keep it? So that's, that's the kind of thing. Sometimes people don't have control over the lighting, so we can help you have higher performance. So you can do something like this, turn off part of the light, keep the other light on. A lot of times people have old buzzing fluorescence they want to get rid of. That's another benefit of energy efficiency. Uh, the third point is more certainty. If you have a big uh, electricity consumption, then you're very, uh, you're very susceptible to, to rises in the price of energy. That will really affect your business. But if you can reduce your energy bill, reduce your consumption, then an increase in the price doesn't affect you as much. And so you have more certainty in terms of your business plan. And then the final point, and this is very important to a lot of people here in Maine, is your impact on your community. It's just being a good citizen to run your business in an efficient way, not to waste energy, not to create a lot of pollution. So a lot of folks who hire us, that's, that's a, a driving uh, motivator for them, is to really have a better impact, provide more value as a business. You know, what's the sense of wasting uh, money on energy you don't really need to use? So these are the benefits. This is why people hire us, is to achieve these benefits. And the talk today, I'll just talk a little bit about how we actually get there. So we like to think about efficiency as an investment. And we're going to compare your baseline use, so what's happening now, if you don't do anything, versus what happens if you upgrade. And so <coughs> we calculate a return on investment, which is basically the difference in cost, that's your savings, over the cost of achieving those savings. So we calculate this return on investment. A lot of people ask about payback. 
Um, and we can do that calculation, but we like to um, we like to think more about a return on investment. So here's here's a case study for Street and Company. It's a restaurant in Portland. Uh, they had a lot of things going on there, and we were able to save them an enormous amount of money very quickly. In fact, for every dollar they invest, they're getting five dollars and twenty cents back over the life of these projects. Um, they had an ice making system that was water cooled, so they were dumping water down the drain to cool off their ice making system, and that was an enormous expense. And at the same time they were doing that, they were burning natural gas all summer to produce hot water. So we were able to basically cool off their ice making machine and use that waste heat to produce hot water. So that, that combination saves them an enormous amount of money. They're not wasting all that water, and they're using that waste heat from their ice maker to make the hot water they need. So we did a whole bunch of things for them. You can see the water consumption went down 40%. Natural gas is 14%. They don't have to run any natural gas during the summer. And we did some lighting upgrades, a whole bunch of things. But it was an enormous uh, savings for them. And you know, this whole project took maybe six months from start to finish. But we kept finding more and more things as we were going. And just to allude to a point that Rick made, when we first showed up, Dana Street said, I hate LED lights. I'm not going to put any LED lights in my restaurant. I've tried them all. They don't work. And over the course of the time we were working with them, we brought in about 30 to 40 different LED lights until we found ones that dimmed and gave him the ambiance that he needed <coughs> at his restaurant. And that, that, that was quite a project. I mean, when you sit down with somebody for 30 different lights, we were there for week after week, you know, despairing of ever finding it. We finally did. There is a LED solution to any lighting uh, challenge. So that's been a really great thing for us to really get uh, very knowledgeable about over our year in business. So um, LED lighting has really been a game changer. It seems like everything is now heading over to the LED lighting. Um, but anyway, that's the kind of numbers that we can we can uh, deliver for, for businesses. <coughs> and the way we do that is we build models. We build an energy model and a financial model. And this allows us to do what's called a sensitivity analysis. So we can figure out what happens if we did this, what happens if we did that, what if the price of energy went up, all these different what-if scenarios are possible when you have an energy model. So we think that's an important thing. And we calculate return on investment and then rate of return. So if it takes you 20 years to, to earn a dollar, that's not as much as if it takes, only takes you a year to earn that dollar. So the rate of return is really what we're going after. Uh, we can calculate simple payback, but most of the calculations we've seen don't include depreciation or inflation. So basically, it's kind of a meaningless number. It doesn't really tell you is this a good investment or not. We like to go for a rate of return. And again, we base these on quantifiable energy models. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about what, what kind of calculations go into those models. But it's just a whole lot of math. And we can measure everything and really give you a good sense of what is this going to do for your bottom line? How much are we going to increase your profit? We can calculate how much pollution you can prevent. We can really give you the answers to those questions you have as business owners to make an informed decision. Um, so here are the, here are the best opportunities. Um, for most commercial clients, and we do strictly commercial work, lighting is probably at the top of the list. With the LED lighting, it's affordable, it, it's high performing, it's non-toxic, it's widely available. So really, if you haven't upgraded your lighting, I would highly recommend taking a look at LED lighting. Um, and then there's HVAC. I mean, everybody in Maine, we're a cold climate. Everybody knows that it costs a lot to heat. Um, but with commercial properties, a lot of that uh, expense is actually ventilation. You, you have to heat air, and then you, you duct it and send it right out of your business. So there's a lot to do by, by thinking about these, these buildings as systems. And I think any, if you ever talk to an energy auditor, they'll all talk about the building as a system. We think about it the same way. So it's not just heating, but it's ventilation and air conditioning all at the same time. And then hot water. Uh, the heat pump technology has now come a long way. So if you're burning anything to produce hot water, you might want to rethink that. The heat pumps are more than 100% efficient. People always ask me that. That's impossible. It violates the second law of thermodynamics, all this stuff. That's not true. You can move heat from one place to another. That's what a heat pump does. So you can actually spend a little bit of energy to move heat and get a lot more heat for the energy that you pay for. And that's what a heat pump does. So you can be 340% <coughs> efficient, and if you're burning something, you really can never get above 100% efficient. So heat pumps can get you over that 100% efficiency, and they can open up a whole lot of opportunities. 
and I just mentioned uh, Street and Company, we've done that for almost all of our clients. When we look at it, run the numbers, a heat pump for hot water really makes sense. In almost every commercial setting, there's some waste heat being generated, and we can uh, capture that heat with an air source heat pump, and we can also directly sometimes scrub the heat with a closed loop heat pump. But in any case, heat pumps are really a great way to make hot water. Interestingly, solar has become less interesting. A lot of people used to do solar hot water directly heating the, the water with, or directly heating glycol, and then, anyway, solar hot water has kind of taken a back seat. We see people doing solar PV, so solar electricity, and then using that electricity in a heat pump to make hot water. So it's been very interesting that there's that shift. Um, and the last thing that people ought to look at is refrigeration. And uh, there's a lot of things we can do. Probably 10 years from now, we'll be talking about solid state refrigeration, similar to the way we're talking about solid state lighting. And, and what that will mean is that we won't have compressors and pumps and all that. We'll have materials that refrigerate directly. But right now, we're still, uh, we still are pumping things around for refrigeration. And so most of the uh, gains there are, are making sure you don't have any excess heat inside your cooler. I just was in a cooler yesterday, and they had incandescent light bulbs inside their cooler which is like having a space heater in your cooler. It's not a good idea. Um, so we can get rid of that. Uh, but then the fan motors are also, people have very inefficient fans in their evaporators. And there again, that evaporator is, uh, is providing the cold air inside the unit. But if you have an inefficient fan in there, that's also dumping extra heat inside your refrigerator. So if we can get rid of any excess heat inside that refrigeration unit, we can save you a lot of money. And you also spend less money on that fan because it's a more efficient fan. So there's a lot of things we can do with refrigeration, and I'll talk more detail a little bit later. Um, but let's, let's talk about lighting. So how many folks here have done lighting projects? Has anybody upgraded lighting? OK, great. And did you guys do LEDs? How many did LEDs when you did that? A couple. How, how many did fluorescence? OK. Yeah, so a year ago when we started, we were talking to some engineers, and, and it really was, should we go fluorescence? Should we go LED? Now, almost every project, when you run the numbers, LEDs make more sense. The prices come down. There's a lot more uh, choice in the marketplace. And one of the big drivers um, for lighting is that you can control LEDs very well. You can dim them. You can turn them on and off. And the ballast and, and fluorescence, sometimes you have challenges doing that. It's, it's a lot easier, actually, to control an LED uh, light. So the first thing we do uh, we go into a place to see if there's any controls we can put on the existing lights. If we don't have to do anything besides a motion sensor or a dimmer or a timer or something, that's great. That's a great way to save energy. But a lot of times we get into that and it's a fluorescent with a ballast that doesn't want to be shut off and things like that. And then that leads us to let's upgrade the lamp technology. So these are probably, <coughs> you never know, they're probably uh, fluorescent here and they've got a ballast and all that. The, the, worst, the worst kind of lighting is the incandescent, which is, these are probably incandescent. And that incandescent just means glowing hot. So basically, you put in a space heater, and 90% of the, the energy coming out of that is heat, and 10% is light. So you're, you're creating light by getting something glowing hot. And that was great for the 1800s. It was wonderful. New technology in 1880. But today, that is just a terrible waste of energy. So then you can step up to fluorescence, where you have a tube full of toxic material. It's got mercury in it. You spark across that mercury vapor, and then it produces light that we can't see. It's absorbed by phosphor, and then it fluoresces back out as visible light. That's better. It's more efficient. But then you've got a fragile lamp full of toxic material, and most people are moving away from that. And there's an, we're getting into the upper limit of the efficiency there. We're, we're really able now, with uh, some other lighting, the high intensity discharge, and then the light emitting diodes. And this is where everything is going. Light emitting diode is basically a solar cell in reverse. Solar cell takes light and produces energy, and uh, an LED chip takes energy and produces light. It's basically the same physical process, just run backwards. So it's a solid state piece of material. It's uh, very uh, rugged. Uh, it's non-toxic, you know, you're not gonna in the landfill and have mercury leaching anywhere, and, uh, and they're very small, so you can have very, lots of very interesting packaging, and, and so we can, have, we can have an LED that looks almost exactly like an incandescent, you can have one that's a tube, you can have, you know, 
little chips all over the place. So it's, it, it's very, very flexible. So that's, that's the, the technology. So in a retrofit situation, if we, if we came in to a place and you were um, retrofitting, we'd be looking at, at this left column. You can also do this all in new construction, of course. But if you're starting new or you're doing a significant renovation, there's some additional things we could do. Um, if we were to look at this room, for example, we could say, are the fixtures in the right place? And could we do more with daylighting? And what kind of control system would we want for this whole building? That, that's the kind of things you can talk about when you're building new or you're doing significant renovation. And if you can do it all, you can really uh, dial it in and, and really save a whole lot of energy. Um, so basically, uh, we just want to dive in a little bit deeper into lighting. A lot of people are confused. They used to go to the store and buy a 60 watt light bulb. Anybody remember doing those days? You could go in with a 60 watt, 75 watt. You knew what you were getting. It's all pretty much the same. It's all incandescent. I was just on a trip overseas, and this guy was saying, "Why do they have? Why is it so complicated now? There's like color temperature, and there's lumens, and there's all these things I never even heard about. It used to be so simple, and now it's complicated." Well, the basic thing that's going on with the light is that you you input power, so power comes in, it's energy over time, that's measured in watts, and what you get out <coughs> is actually lumens. And we didn't really worry about that years ago because this, it was always the same technology. You always got the same amount of lumens per watt. It was never really varied. So you could just worry about the power input. Well, now it's a lot more complicated because the lumens is the visible radiation. That's what we can see per second, and so now you can actually get more lumens per watt. And the more lumens you get, the more light out per watt, the more efficacious the bulb is. They call it efficacious, and I'll explain that in a second. So it's not efficiency, it's efficacy. So if you look at this light bulb, it's producing light in all directions. So you put in a certain amount of power, and you get lumens out, and they go everywhere. Um, so, so the more efficacious the bulb is, it means the more lumens you get per watt you, you put in. Now, my next slide here will talk about um, sort of the difference here. So, so this is sort of comparing the performance of lamp technology. So the efficacy is the column going up. It goes from, you know, the incandescent is probably around a 10 in terms of efficacy. So you get 10 lumens per watt. The fluorescent is up around 60. This LED is around 90. We're, we're getting ones now that are 120 lumens per watt. So you can get a lot more light per unit of energy, or the power you put in, you get more light out. And then the, the uh, horizontal scale is how long this thing lasts. So not only is it more efficacy, efficacious, but it also is much longer lasting. And, and this, I just pulled this up last night just from lamps we could buy off the shelf. We're actually getting ones that are 75,000, 88,000. I mean, these, these LEDs, again, they're a solid piece of material. Just like a solar cell lasts 30 years out on, the, on your roof, these LEDs are rugged, rugged material. So they will last a long time. They're not like the fluorescents. The fluorescents are very fragile technology. I used to have a store and I would sell CFLs and people would always come back and it didn't work and didn't last. That doesn't happen in general with the LEDs. Um, it is possible to buy really cheap, crappy LEDs, so you can, you know, get a dud. But the LED itself is a DC chip, and what fails often is the driver that converts the AC power to DC. So sometimes you can get a bad driver, but the L the light emitting diode itself is extremely rugged and extremely long lasting. So if you can get a good driver, and that's the piece of equipment that changes the AC to the DC that the LED chip uses, as long as that driver lasts. And you can also get uh, lighting that has a separate driver, so if the driver fails, you can just replace that. The LED chip is going to last a very long time, and it's going to be very efficacious. So that's why everybody is going to LED lighting. It's non-toxic, it just performs better, and it looks great. <coughs> All right, so, so here's the calculation. So um, when, we, uh, when we try to figure out the baseline cost, this, this scenario here is just a project we did yesterday. Went into a convenience store. They have a whole bunch of fluorescent tubes inside a cooler, right? So the fluorescent tubes are wasting energy inside the cooler. They're 85 watts. Um, they're always on. They're never dimmed. We know how many hours a day they're on. And so we can just run this calculation and figure out it's costing them $1,800 a year to run those lights. And I'll just, you'll notice that uh, the upgrade says we're going to replace the 85 watt um, 
tube with a 22 watt LED. And you're thinking, how's how's that possible? That's that's a lot more lumens per watt. You know, if we're just trying to match lumens. And this is the difference between efficacy and efficiency. It turns out that LEDs are very directional. So whereas a fluorescent tube, the lumens come out and they're, they're going in every direction. With the LEDs, they're only coming out in one direction. So we can actually get the same brightness where we care about it for many fewer uh, lumens. So this is why it's a little complicated to compare when you're trying to compare efficiency. It's not just the efficacy. It's not just lumens per watt. You will get a brighter experience with a 22 watt LED lamp than you get with an 85 watt fluorescent lamp. And it has to do with not just the efficacy, but also the directionality and the light quality, the, the particular frequencies of light that come out of that chip. So there's a lot that goes into it. But, but we know that this is going to give them actually brighter light and it's gonna, the, the final thing on the, on the top line on the right it has a 1.5 location factor. And we know that not only are we spending less money on the light itself, but we're spending less money on the excess heat that we're not generating. So that's that 1.5 location factor. If this was outside, that would be a one. If this was in a freezer, it would be a two because we have to maintain that, that temp temperature delta higher. So <coughs> that location factor is kind of, accounting for the indirect energy cost. Anyway, all in, we're, we're figuring it's going to cost $477 per year to operate the LED lights versus $1,800 a year to operate the fluorescent. So you can see, it's great to have efficiency mains, but you don't really need a lot of encouragement to do a project like that. I mean, as long as we're reasonable, you're saving $1,400 a year, and I'm in and out in a morning, and, and you get better, you know, when we did this in a grocery store, they're like, wow, this is great. We can see all the products now. You know, So it's really, you'd say a no-brainer. There is a lot of math involved to figure out this number, though. So it's a no-brainer once you have the number. It's a little bit of calculation to get to that number. Um, and then the other thing we do is we calculate depreciation, which is the cost of the equipment over the useful life. These lamps, the fluorescent lamps are really cheap. It's like less than $5. And then the LED is very expensive. It's almost 80 bucks. Like, oh, I'm not going to, some people, believe it or not, will say, I'm not going to spend 80 bucks on it. I don't care how much I save. That's just too much. You know, I can buy this fluorescent tube for $5. So we do the, um, the depreciation. And when you add it all together, um, this is the difference. So per year, even accounting for depreciation, um, it's a huge difference. So this is really where doing some math, having the model, you can really save an enormous amount of energy. <coughs> Don't be put off by the high cost of these LEDs. They're worth it. They really will save you a lot of money. It, it's hard for people to pay $80 for a thing they know should cost five. They say this has to come, but it is really going to save you some money. So, And the sooner you do this, the sooner you make the money. It's like saving for retirement. I mean, you can wait to, to get a few dollars more here, but it's already pretty darn good. There's no point in wasting money today. And, and I have people say, well, I'm going to wait till LEDs get a little cheaper. Like, but even if that depreciation went from $3.90 and cut in half, is that really going to change? The, it's not. So, you know, I say don't wait for LEDs to come down in price. It's not really driving the, the, the calculation that much for you. It's, it's the energy waste right now. You're going to save a lot more energy um, by upgrading right away. Okay, so that was the light in it. I guess I'll wait until we take questions. But uh, now I'm going to just talk briefly about some other things. I went into detail on the lighting. I'm not going to go into that much detail about the other things. But when we think about HVAC, again, there's, there's things you can do <coughs> in the retrofit situation. There's things you can do when you're, when you're building new. In the retrofit situation, the controls, uh, if you don't have good uh, programmable thermostat on your HVAC, HVAC system, you should. And if you're not using it, um, you should program it. We, we often go in and people have programmable thermostats, but they're not programmed right because nobody can figure out how to use them. So uh, that's an important piece is get a programmable thermostat that's easy to use and use it. Um, sometimes timers can work if, if that works for you. Do a simple timer. Um, some things we can add on to HVAC technology. We can add a variable frequency drive. And this basically uh, makes your uh, motors be able to run slower. So you can... If, if, for example, you've got a restaurant and you're, you have some code that requ requires a certain amount of flow, but you don't need that flow all the time. So you can 
dial back with the VFD, if you put a VFD on your motors, you can dial back the exhaust and that saves all that heat that you brought into your building. You don't have to recondition that air. And same with cooling in the summer, if you don't have to exhaust all that all the time. So that's something we, we can add that really saves you a lot of money. Uh, heat pumps, again, there's uh, not just for hot water, but for um, space heating. People are putting in heat pumps. It's been a huge uptake this year. The technology is really advanced. There's now the air source heat pumps work down to very cold temperatures. So they're a viable uh, technology here in Maine. Uh, and then the final thing we do, and this is really kind of the best bang for the buck, we'll go in and do a system recommissioning, which just is, we will take a look at all the knobs and all the settings and why is this set so high. And it's amazing how many systems were set up and then they clean it, but they never really think about how is it working. And uh, so we'll go in and do a full system recommissioning and we'll almost always find something that's not working right. Um, and especially in the summer, there's, there's a lot of things you can do in the summer that um, people just have their, leave their systems on all the time and they're wasting enormous amounts of fuel. When you're designing a new space, and we have a couple opportunities to do that as, in our company, uh, of course we work with engineers and other people, but a big, a big thing we, we do is the uh, um, energy analysis, the energy calculations. So we're looking at insulation and air sealing, making sure we're not trying to heat the great outdoors. We want to just heat inside the building and insulation and air sealing is the way you can do that. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to the load calculation and make sure that we are confident about that. A lot of times people will just do sort of back of the envelope, rule of thumb sort of thing, and then they oversize. And that's a great way to waste energy and spend more money than you need to. If you, can, if you're, if you have confidence in your calculations and you know it's going to work, then you can size the equipment properly It'll cost you less to operate, it'll be cheaper to buy. So we really try to um, be confident in our load calculations so that we can stand behind our, our sizing recommendations. Um, there's heat recovery and energy recovery systems now, so you, you actually exchange air, but you heat it up on the way. An energy recovery ventilator also exchanges moisture. Uh, so either way, um, it's great. And then finally, in a lot of the new equipment, rather than having an AC motor and putting a VFD on it, you can put a DC motor right into the system. And DC motors, in general, are more efficient and they're easier to control. And so if you can buy new equipment with DC motors in it, that, that's a win for the HVAC side. Um, hot water, I talked a little bit about this. Things we can do in, in retrofit, you can put better fixtures in, you can do heat pumps, system recommissioning, often we'll find the water set too high. People didn't read the code, so we're in a restaurant and they have the water set to like 140 or 160. And why? It's like, well, we thought it had to be, and well, not for washing your hands. And we went into one restaurant and they were burning themselves. They always had to turn a little bit of cold water on because the hot water was was actually dangerous for the employees. And it's like, okay, that is that is just bad all <laughs> up and down. So let's turn the system down, and your guys won't be burning themselves, and you won't be wasting so much energy. Uh, again, like anything, um, if we can get in there and do the load calculation and equipment sizing, if we can get you a, an efficient dishwasher, and then we don't have to heat as much hot water, and that saves you all around. Um, we did the uh, Portland Food Co-op, and so we scrub waste heat from their compressors, all their coolers and stuff, and use that, that commercial heat recovery system to reduce their hot water, so they don't have to be running a hot water system. So in a, in a new construction or a deep renovation, you can do the commercial heat recovery for the water heaters. Um, and then refrigeration is the last, I think my second to last slide here. Um, in, in a refrigerator, I think I've already talked a little bit about this, but there's evaporator fan motors that are usually 24 seven. Upgrading those are great. A lot of uh, commercial um, coolers will have door heaters and these are uh, preventing condensation. So you've got a cold surface there and uh, that would, that would uh, condense, it's called sweating. Um, but you don't need those heaters on all the time. And in fact, in the winter time, there's usually not enough moisture in the air to even cause condensation. So we went into a grocery store, we retrofitted, we, we put in a control system that has a little sensor that when it starts to condense, it turns on the heater to, to well, we didn't know where to put it because we left, we turned the heater completely off and it wasn't condensing. We went back, so, so it hasn't <coughs> condensed, you know, and I think it'll start condensing soon, but it's been since December. And a year ago, they were running that heater 
just wasting energy for no reason at all. So an anti-sweat heater control is a great thing to do. Um, you can do defrost cycle controls. Um, we went into a place that had a brick um, fish cooler and no insulation on it. Just putting an inch of insulation allowed us to downsize the compressor and keep that uh, system working a lot better. Uh, reduce some of the condensation that was forming there. Um, and then, we've never done this, but people always ask, there are fresh air economizers. You can bring cold air outside into your cooler. Uh, it might work in some places in Maine, although as the climate changes, maybe not. Um, if you have really cold air, you can, in theory, bring it in and not have to actually condition the air. So it's possible to do the fresh air economizer. Um, and then again, new construction, we really, really like to do that analysis, uh, get the numbers and trust them. Don't oversize just because you want to have that safety margin. Really engineer it and, uh, and put the right stuff in. Okay, uh, that's it. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Any, any questions? Or yeah. yeah. Open it up for questions now. You spoke a lot about uh, lighting and like the lamp itself. Right. Have you been, uh, or, or is there a lot of movement on lighting controls and, and full building system controls? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and one of the interesting things is, again, it's really well matched with uh, LED. And so, uh, especially daylight controls, where you can uh, you can design for a certain uh, lux value. So we do an, a lighting design, and we, we calculate how many lumens per square meter we need. And then you can have your control system, if it's sensing daylight coming in, you can automatically dim your artificial lights. And that's a great energy saver. So those, it typically happens though, it's, it's hard to make the numbers work in a retrofit. In a retrofit, we're looking at motion sensors, we might look at a timer, um, but if you're doing a new system, then absolutely there's a lot of work being done. And especially if you're replaced, if you, if you stay away from the high intensity discharge, certain lighting technology <coughs> doesn't like to be turned on and off, it's hard to dim. If you go to the LED, it opens up this world of possibilities with controls. And you can do Wi-Fi and you can, you know, from Bermuda, you can be seeing how your building's going and all sorts of great things. But yeah, absolutely, there's, there's a lot of control. If I could add a little yep. bit on that, um, just as the LEDs were coming and it exploded, the idea of advanced lighting controls and the um, integration with the LEDs is, is a thing that is being worked on now. Uh, there's a lot of things with build automated building systems that are already in existence, what do we do by adding a module in for uh, lighting? Uh, there is a part of the Design Light Consortium, uh, which Efficiency Maine uses to vet light fixtures, is also working on the uh, advanced lighting controls aspect. And as that begins to mature, you'll see some movement in that. Right now, that can be submitted through a custom track with Efficiency Main, uh, but I think in time it will it will end up being something we really want to add on. We did a potential study in the state, and 95% of the lights in Maine are uncontrolled, which means there is a large opportunity for savings, and we need to explore that. So that is something. Uh, you know, we just don't think it's right for Efficiency Main to put out a lighting control because of the communication protocols. It's all proprietary, and will that cause market confusion? So we'll let that mature a little bit and see where it goes. Um, you have a slide on the upgrading lighting, the energy consumption equation. Yep. Yep. Um, do you mind just going to that slide? Sure. Real quick? I just had a question Same. about. Of it. Yeah. Um, the location factor, energy right. cost, can you just right. touch on that? Yeah, so that's where the lamp is actually located. If it's outside a cooler, that's a one because mm -hmm. we're just measuring the, um, the direct energy. But if it's inside a cooler, actually that waste heat that that uh, lamp is producing then has to be removed by the cooling system. So it's, it's an indirect factor. So we know that not only are we saving the direct energy that we're using to produce light, but then we don't have to run the refrigerator as hard, so there's extra savings. And okay. that's just for incandescent lighting in the cooler? No, it's any, it's any light. There's it, it, when you think about uh, radiation coming out of light, that's energy that's going to be absorbed inside the cooler, 
and then that energy has to be removed from the cooler. So whether it's LED, incandescent, fluorescent, it's all, all of that extra energy you're putting in, it's kind of like you fill up a bucket, you got to take the water out. Um, so if you put, if you, so we're putting in, uh, I don't know how many watts it was, but 22 watts, each of those lamps is putting in 22 watts of power in that cooler, and if we don't take that out, it's going to get hotter and hotter and hotter in there. So we've got to take out that 22 watts, and that's where that 1.5 factor is. And so it costs, it costs you more money to run your lights inside a cooler than it does outside a cooler because you have to keep that cooler cool and you're heating it up when you put a light in it. Any kind of light at all is going to heat it up a little bit. Brett, can I ask you a quick question? On sure. The, on yeah. the lighting, you mentioned the depreciation and factoring that into the cost, but um, yeah, it was one of the previous ones. But something that was uh, notably missing from this is the labor cost because if right. you have either an incandescent bulb or you have a uh, fluorescent bulb, you're going to have to replace that. Right. one, two, three, or more times during right. the whole lifespan of one LED. And so you factor that in, and that number becomes even larger. Yeah, that equip so in our actual model, the equipment that's just the equipment cost. We also have a labor cost to replace, and that would be factored into this. Ca I was filling up this slide as it was. You know, I didn't want to bring my whole model in, but that's a great point. There is, and, and that, that labor cost can actually dwarf the equipment cost, it's, especially if it's in a hard-to-reach area. Um, great point, yeah. yeah. I've got a couple questions with the refrigeration, actually. Um, you had mentioned for the Portland Food Co-op, you, uh, you're heating the hot water using the heat created from the compressors for the cooler. Right. Is that just a matter of putting a, a, a heat pump next to the compressor and, and sucking up the hot air coming out of it? Are you repiping the compressor? Or? Yeah, we actually, in that system, it is a, a liquid-cooled system. But we have done it where we're just putting an air source heat pump next to, in fact, that's what we did in the uh, ice maker for Street & Company. It was an enclosed room, and rather than deal with plumbing, we just put a, a heat pump right there. So actually, a little more gongo, we put a fan in and a couple other things. But, but we're just taking the air, and, and that's how we're getting the hot you water. You need to out. have, uh, like basically, a thermostat fan in the room as well, so if you're not using enough hot water, you can start venting the heat outside? Or exactly, so? that's exactly what we did. We just put a little thermos, thermo, uh, thermostat on a fan, yeah. and so we know that we don't want that room to get too hot because then the ice maker wouldn't really be able to make ice. So that's exactly right. The heat pump in that room is doing a certain amount, then we have a thermostat and a fan, so that if we have excess heat, we, we dump it out. And then another question is on your uh, evaporator unit. Um, in the freezer, obviously, they have to have a warm cycle so that they can thaw out. Right. And a lot of times, you'll have copper pipe with heat tape coming around it. Right. Um, and is there a more efficient way to do that that you've found? I mean, is it just controlling when the heat tape comes on and make sure it's not running 24-7? Or Yeah, there's... um. So there's reversible systems, so that normally what you do is you have an electric defrost uh, unit that comes with like the heat tape, right. and, and the other thing you can do is if you have the right kind of system, you can run your um, you know, refrigerated fluid backwards through it, so it comes in hot instead of cold. So, um, <coughs> but in general, we don't worry about that, um, but it's possible to, to do all that, for right. sure. I hate the idea of dumping heat into a freezer. Yeah, I know, it makes no sense. We had this uh, client who was running his defrost cycle more often, thinking he was saving money doing that, and we measured the, the circuit, and <laughs> that electric heater came on, and it was way more amps than, <coughs> you know, it's like, it would be, it, so we just finally convinced him that it was better to not to run it so often. He was thinking, boy, I want to keep that evaporator from yeah. freezing up, and it's important not to freeze up, but you don't want to run your defrost cycle in general any more than you need to. Right. So, right. yeah. And a final question for efficiency, main. I thought I heard, so July 1st is when you'll figure out if there's funding available again, and that's when we can start. Um, well, let me be clear. The program year for efficiency, main starts 1 July. So our budgets would be from 1 July to June 30th of next year. Yep. Um, when we determine that our budget, because we have a backlog of projects that uh, are in the system and we want to make sure we can honor those that have some financial exposure already made, once we get all that cleaned up, we'll know exactly how much uh, going into the program year and uh, it will gauge when we can turn the switch back on yeah, for those yeah. programs. Any, I mean, even rough ideas when... 
uh, a switch we'll so called be <laughs> if I had a crystal ball on a lot of things I'd be able to predict a lot uh, yeah. you know I'd help you all predict where your energy prices are going but I don't have yeah. that crystal ball uh, certainly it is a priority for efficiency main to have the business incentive program with the light switch on so uh, right currently though you your agenda to give us instructions on how to get you the paperwork prior to July 1 for the jobs in this vacuum period. There is a, there is some vacuum of <coughs> projects that we already have obligated funds for and um, we want to make sure we can honor those and then work with our contractors and they'll be the first ones to know when the when the gate is open again. Uh, I would suspect uh, with the board's commitment to the program uh, we'll be we'll be able to have the switch on uh, you know after one July. Uh, Rick, it's not quite what I was asking. We've got projects online right now that I can't enter that you're not aware of. So last, yeah. last weekend we, we, well, we yeah. talked about a project yeah. to get them in here. We'll have instructions. We're working on that right okay. now uh, for see. the contractors. Okay, yeah. I, I want to stay out of that kind of conversation with business owners. Right, sure. yeah. Any other last questions? Great. Then let's, uh, well, first, thank you very much. <coughs> I, got one, I got one question here. Um, <laughs> you had mentioned something about uh, AC to DC motor conversion. Uh, right. For, for power saving. Yep. Um, and I was thinking about that and the, the loss uh, in the AC to DC conversion. <coughs> How much loss do you actually have going from AC to DC um, in that conversion? So say you have a you know a 25 horse motor right. that runs it runs yeah. so many kilowatts to power this motor. Right. Um, you're you're going to have to have um, a, you know this piece of equipment to transform it to a DC. Right. That's going to suck energy. Yeah. Well, ironically enough, a DC motor is more efficient. Even though you're converting the AC power to DC, and there is some loss in that conversion. The electronically commutated motors, ECM motors, are digital motors, and those are more efficient than your faded pole motors, which are you know, an AC motor. Mm -hmm. So what, what actually happens is if, if we have a, an AC motor, an induction motor that we want to control, we can put what's called a variable frequency drive, which is basically a, a DC device which can vary the frequency, so vary the speed that that motor is turning. So we can actually reduce the amount of power that that AC motor is using, and we'll stick that VFD onto a, an AC motor. But if we had our druthers, what we'd rather do is forget that and just put an ECM motor in. Even though there is a little bit of loss doing that AC to DC conversion, it's still inherently so much more efficient and easier to control. Once you have a DC motor, I can put a control signal into it and really control it very, very uh, you know, finally. So, so it doesn't sound like it should work, but it actually is more efficient to put in a DC motor even if your building is uh, supplied by AC. It's kind of odd, almost all the stuff is DC. So we have all these AC coming in and then we have all these devices that are basically turning the AC into DC. The LEDs are DC, the DCM motors are DC, our computers are DC. I mean, I'm wondering if you know, we go forward, maybe do that conversion once and get it really well and then everything's DC inside. I don't know, that's not, that's not happening, but we're putting all these devices in there whose purpose is to convert AC to DC. And I don't know, Phil, you know, anybody here know what the percentage efficiency of that equipment is? Well, in an inverter, you, yeah. know, you're, you have a couple percent loss. Yeah, so yeah, maybe two or three percent loss just in that. But certainly those devices are everywhere and there's a lot of competition, a lot of work being done to make sure that that conversion is done as efficiently as possible. Okay. One, last, one last part to that. To the higher the horsepower of the motor, um, is it, are the results the same? So for instance, if you're running a, a 24 horse AC, <coughs> but you decide to convert to DC, or a 50 horse motor, yeah. Um, it, it, or is it based on just smaller motors? Yeah, honestly, we're, we're dealing with like, I think it was 120 HP motor that I looked at yesterday. I personally don't have experience with those bigger motors, um, and our, our business focuses on commercials, so we're, we're mostly evaporator fan motors, 
um, you know, HVAC motors, compressor motors, things like that, and they're not 20 horsepower usually um, that we're dealing with. Um, yeah. There may be some big systems out there, but you know, in a restaurant, so, and we just look it up. I mean, the, the manufacturers will tell us, and then we always clamp things to make sure that we're getting, one thing I didn't mention is we like to go back after we've done the project, look at your bill, clamp some things, make sure that what we thought going in is actually happening on the way out, and we've been very uh, pleased that we've almost been completely spot on. Like we measured the, the, the amps on that and it's what we thought it was gonna be. So this this stuff does work, it's, it's as advertised. The LEDs and the ECMs are two, and they're they're vetted by Efficiency Main. So almost everything we do is just prescriptive. It's already been through all their system. We do our own due diligence, but it's out there and it's working. Um, but it's a good, good, very good question. I don't know how it's scaled up to the really, the really big stuff. Yeah, I mean, my largest board would be around 110 horse. So, yeah. Well, you know, that, I, I just was curious yeah. as far as. I'd love to work for it and we'll find out. We'll yeah. learn something new. <laughs> yeah. Cut me a deal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thank Great. you very much. All right, thanks. Um, Do you want me to move? Uh, yeah, sure. So you okay. want to <coughs> jump on over the hot seat? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. yeah. from Phil Cook, and Phil uh, has been involved with a number of different companies around Maine, uh, ranging from uh, Revision Energy, Revision Solar, uh, Revision Heat, um, and uh, he's here to give a presentation on some solar. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, Fred, great presentation. Thanks for that. Um, appreciate you. everybody coming out this morning. I think Fred's a little modest. I just want to um, mention that I think he's pretty much completely off of fossil fuels at his home in Brunswick. He has solar electricity, solar hot water, he's got an electric vehicle charging station that's powered by solar, and he's just a phenomenal example of what the opportunity here is in Maine, both from an efficiency standpoint and from a renewable energy standpoint. Um, my name's Phil, I'm a co-founder of Revision Energy, we're a local solar energy company. Um, I've got a book I'm just going to pass around if you want to see some examples of our workmanship. Um, we've been around Maine for 10 years now, and, uh, and our mission is to help um, foster a transition from our fossil fuel-based economy to a clean, sustainable, renewable energy-based economy. And I think that's pretty critical for our state. Um, Maine has no indigenous fossil fuels. So everything that we get basically comes from away, whether it's, uh, it's oil from other parts of the world, other parts of the country, or natural gas from the hydrofracking down in, in um, the Marcellus Shale. The reality is, is that we're in some ways at the kind of the end of the pipeline for most of our energy choices. And um, right now we're hearing a lot of messaging from the state that natural gas is gonna save us all from the, from the oil that's been the problem for the last 60 years. And, and I'm pretty skeptical about that, that proposition. Um, I want to start out talking about the big picture situation for Maine. And, and uh, by doing, we'll start at the 100,000 foot level. Um, you know, today we have 7 billion people on the planet. Uh, every year we're emitting 11 billion tons of carbon pollution. Um, that converts to 22 trillion pounds of carbon pollution every year. And if you were able to stuff the carbon into coal cars, like you see in the image there, the train would be 159,000 miles long and it would go around, wrap around the earth seven times. That's one year of humanity's carbon pollution um, that we're you know, putting into the atmosphere every year. And <clears throat> having done that now for almost 200 years through the Industrial Revolution where we're you know, we're digging the fossil fuels out of the earth that took millions and millions of years to form, and now we've, we're, we're burning those fossil fuels and, and stuffing them into a closed atmosphere. We now have uh, more than 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is a level we haven't seen for 
35 million years, um, and it's happened in a big hurry. You can see in the historical time chart there that there have always been cyclical fluctu fluctuations in, in CO2 content in the atmosphere and cyclical, uh, uh, a mirrored reflection in the, um, in the temperature of the atmosphere. And that spike that we are now causing through the Industrial Revolution is, is a scary time for us. <clears throat> So again, you know, at Revision Energy, we, be, we believe that the, uh, the best response to this information is to move away from fossil fuels as fast as we possibly can. Um, <clears throat> the problem for Maine right now is that Maine actually has the highest per capita carbon pollution in New England. Uh, we have the highest per capita uh, oil consumption in New England. And one thing that strikes me is that in the last 30 years as our paper and pulp industry has declined, Tourism has gradually become Maine's biggest economic driver, uh, accounting for about $7 billion a year in economic activity and about 85,000 jobs. And I think it's really dangerous to have a, a tourism economy, which is predicated on a pristine natural environment, um, to have this kind of dirty little reality that Maine actually has the highest per capita carbon pollution in the region. Probably not a good long-term recipe for success and sustainability of, the, of that tourism economy. Um, anybody have a guess as to where that is? The clue is that it, it's not Old Orchard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so that's Monte Carlo, actually. And, um, and the reason Monte Carlo is relevant to Maine is that even though we don't have the same exact climate as the French Riviera, Maine's, Maine's latitude is identical to Marseille, uh, France. Um, we, have, we have the same latitude as the French Mediterranean. And so uh, while after a winter like we just had, it's a little bit counterintuitive to believe this, um, Maine actually has a very powerful solar resource on, on an annual basis. And thank goodness it's, it's starting to come back around. And Angus King's always pushing that, too. Yes. Yeah, he's, he's a good one for that. So um, this is what a common town looks like in Germany today. You'll notice that pretty much every single roof has solar, and, um, and, they, and they face the solar in almost any direction because the incentives in Germany are really powerful for people to invest in solar energy. Um, as Germany continues to make its transition away from fossil fuels, uh, they're also trying to uh, eliminate nuclear power. This is a utility scale solar energy power plant in Germany that's uh, being used to um, shut down their, their nuke plants. Um, the great news for Maine is that when you look at our annual solar resource, um, we actually get 33% more sunshine per year than Germany. Uh, in that left-hand bubble, you, I'm trying to articulate that Germany actually has the same annual sun sh solar resource as a place like Alaska which is not where we go on, on spring break when we're, <laughs> when we're leaving Maine. Um, so we actually do have a, have a really great opportunity here. And when you look at the, the nationwide variation in solar resource, um, you know, it still surprises me today to, to, to know that we have the same amount of sunshine as Houston, Texas. You know, who would have thunk? Um, very similar to uh, places like the greater Washington metro area uh, on an annual basis. Yeah, and, and right now the, um, the dialogue in, in Augusta around solar is kind of disappointing. Um, after four years of, of attack from, from the LePage administration, it looks like we're up for another four years at this point. And, and one of the things that's being said up there is that solar energy is kind of a hoax. It doesn't really work. And I think the first thing you need to understand is that we actually do have this powerful resource and that yes, it can be harnessed um, to create a good return on investment from clean energy. And I, w the question I want to ask Augusta is, do they think that they're smarter than every engineer in Germany? Because today Germany is almost at 30% nationwide renewable energy penetration. Um, they're on their way to 100% and their goal is to reach 100% by 2050. The reason Germany wants to get away from fossil fuels is that they have no indigenous resources and the people who control the access to, to uh, fossil fuels, mainly Russia, can't be trusted. So Germany has this powerful incentive to get away from fossil fuels and Maine, in a similar boat, has, has none of its own indigenous resources. 
So um, part of the attack on solar has been this accusation that if, if Fred Horch has solar panels on his house um, and he's getting a credit from the utility equal to the rate that he pays for grid power, then that that is somehow an unfair burden on any of you folks who don't have solar on your roof. And so to address this accusation of the of kind of an unfairness factor with solar, last year the Public Utilities Commission was directed to conduct a, su a study and find out what is the value of a solar generated kilowatt hour versus the value of a straight uh, kilowatt hour from the fossil fuel power plant or, or a normal kilowatt hour from the grid. And basically this was, uh, I think people um, were, were gonna, they were hoping to discover that somehow uh, solar was going to be a bad deal for investors. Well, it turns out that over the 30 year expected useful lifespan of solar power, uh, solar panels, a solar kilowatt hour is actually works worth 33 cents. And that's compared to about 13 cents for a normal grid generated kilowatt hour. So what, we're, what we've learned from this PUC study is that solar delivers benefits to everybody not only the homeowner Fred who has it on his roof, but for all of us who may not have it on our own rooftops, solar is delivering strong benefits in the form of avoided pollution, avoided energy costs because you don't have to bring in as much natural gas from away, um, you know, avoided peak demand charges, and a whole host of other benefits that are um, that are outlined in this study. And you can bank it in the winter just like you do money to put it in for your savings. You can and and. To, under today's laws, uh, which is called net energy billing, um, the problem for Fred is that when he generates a solar kilowatt hour and he puts it on the grid, he only gets 13 cents for that kilowatt hour, when in fact the value has been discovered to be more like 33 cents. Um, so we're, we're waiting to see what Augusta is going to do with that information. We're, we're, we're kind of nervous that they are um, trying to poke holes in this report and take away some of this value. Um, what, it remains to be seen what will be the outcome. I think if you start pushing also the, the aspect that the more people that are producing, we're a state that triples in population, and at the time we're producing the most of our solar, it can go back onto the grid, which is mean we're going to not have to be getting our big machineries going right. to take care of our triple in population. Mm -hmm. Our people that have the solar can be taking up that. Right, solar um, has has a has an ideal match with Maine's peak load profile, which is from n noon until 4 p.m. on a sunny day in July, when all of our factories are running and our air conditioning is running. The electrical grid is under tremendous strain, while a solar panel is doing its maximum output from noon to 4 p.m. on that sunny day in July, and therefore the solar panel is offsetting this peak strain on our grid. Um, so it's a really ideal match, and it's, and it's a way to use solar power to obviate the need for more poles and wires. You know, right now, our, our nationwide grid system has 130 million wooden poles holding up our, our energy infrastructure. What happens in a worsening climate environment when you're getting more severe storms? Do you want to have 130 million wooden poles holding up your wires? Um, probably not a good long-term strategy for energy delivery. Um, with Fred's solar panels on his own roof, he's making his power at the point of consumption, which is much, much more efficient. Am I dreaming or did I read somewhere that there was actually a proposal to, to penalize people that were generating more than they could use? That's what the... It, it, and that was the petition last year from the utilities to the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, CMP wanted to charge people standby fees for having a solar array on the roof. Um, yeah, is that, dead? that is dead for now, but you we also got, you also know that Governor LePage has brought in a second commissioner, and he gets to pick one more, and so that um, that feels like an uncomfortable situation for us. Have we done anything as far as also making sure people are aware that even in cities you can utilize like mirrors to utilize the solar? So if you're behind something. In Europe, they're also using mirrors, mm -hmm. so they can pick up. If you're, if you've only yeah. got a north side on your apartment, you put a yeah. solar grid. They're actually using mirrors on the opposite side to hit the solar panel. Yeah, and they're I think also moving in this area so that when our sun changes, that the panels can change. Right. 
Yep, and I'll get to some some of the tracking array information as we as we go along here. And if we could just hold the rest of the questions until the yeah. end. That would be great. Thank you know, for for for, for 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 all of you as both homeowners and maybe business owners or or municipal administrators, um, this this uh, this report came came out from Bloomberg News last week. And we thought this was pretty interesting. This is what they're forecasting for in terms of growth of energy supply. Um, you know, what, what's going to come from fossil fuels and what's going to come from renewables. And, and that is a, you know, a paradigm shift in what they're forecasting for United States energy consumption. Can you all see that? Um, and as Fred was saying about the light emitting diodes, um, you know, there is a bit of an upfront investment required to get the long term return on investment. Um, the way I talk about it is if you can afford the expensive breakfast for, for these remedies, then you get a free lunch and dinner for, for the life of the system. <laughs> and the, the life of these systems is decades. You know, a LED, 30 years lifespan, a solar panel, 35 plus <coughs> years expected useful lifespan is really a tremendous long-term return on investment. And if you believe what this graph is showing us, this forecast from, from Bloomberg is telling us, then um, those who invest earlier in renewable energy are going to reap the greatest long-term benefits. So um, I want to get into uh, some of the systems that we install. Uh, Fred was talking about um, solar hot water not being quite as prevalent today, and I, I would agree with that, except in the case of really high hot water consumption on a, in, in a summertime load situation. This is a, the Alouette Hotel down in Old Orchard Beach. Um, they're basically a summertime business, and folks are coming in trying to wash off all the sand and salt from the day. Tremendous hot water consumption. This is actually a, an appropriate application for, for a domestic solar hot water system. Um, it's, you know, the strong summer resource coincides exactly with their, their high hot water demand, and they get a, um, an excellent return on investment from this project. It's worth noting that every solar project today qualifies for a 30% federal tax credit, as well as accelerated depreciation on the project, which typically equates to about another 15% tax benefit on the project. So that's 45% of the project paid for by federal tax incentives. Um, this is another solar hot water system that's at the uh, Thorn Dining Hall at Bowdoin College. So if you have a, um, in a, a business or, or an operation that uses a lot of hot water in the summertime, this is the type of solution that can work for you. Um, this is the Saltwater Grill restaurant down in South Portland, Maine. Again, good summertime load there. And now um, just kind of switching quickly to photovoltaics. This is a grid-tied solar electric system that we put in at Carter's Auto Service Garage in Gorham. Uh, the cost for solar electric panels has dropped by about 75% over the last year, uh, excuse me, over the last eight years. So what was once kind of a boutique, hard to afford, kind of impractical solution has now become a really good investment opportunity for business owners, homeowners, even nonprofits and municipalities. How many are panels are on there? I couldn't tell you. It's about a 25 kilowatt array. Yeah, we could count them if you want. <laughs> oh, we can go back and count them at the end. <laughs> yep, e e each square is, uh, call it 280 watts okay. maximum output at peak sun. Thank you. You're welcome. This is Coffee by Design down on Washington Avenue in Portland, 10 kilowatt array. Uh, we just did the math on their return on investment or uh, which is at, oops, their, their ROI is averaging about 7% a year. Uh, right now, they're five years away from payback on that project. We put it in two years ago. This is Aikido of Maine in Portland. He runs a little uh, Thai, uh, excuse me, Kung Fu studio, Taekwondo studio. This is uh, Deepwater Brewing Company in Blue Hill, Maine. Um, and for 
municipalities that have fewer than uh, 50,000 people, towns and cities with fewer than 50,000, you can, these projects also qualify for a 25% uh, REAP grant, Rural Energy for America program. Uh, and so when you can get the 30% tax credit, accelerated depreciation, and a REAP grant, you've now got 80% you know, of your project paid for by tax incentives. At, at Revision Energy, we help with all the applications for, the, for those incentives. There's the Hope General Store in Hope. This is um, a water pur purification plant up in Belfast with both solar hot water and solar electricity. Uh, large array that we did for Oakhurst Dairy, that's at their depot up in Waterville. Uh, Alphond Arena at Thomas College in Waterville, Maine. And that's our, uh, that's our 9 communications, 911 communications center in Cumberland. Um, this gives us an opportunity to talk a little bit about the technology. You can see the shadow on the array that's coming from that communications tower. Um, there are two types of inverter technology that you can use with these solar arrays. Um, the panels on the roof are generating direct current or DC electricity, and then we, we cable that down into the, to the main electricity panel, main electric panel in the building, and somewhere along the way it has to get converted into AC to feed into the panel. On this particular array, the, the a DC to AC inverters are actually tucked up behind each, each panel that's on the roof. Those are called microinverters. And using microinverters, you're isolating each individual solar panel as an independent power producer. So as that shadow migrates across the array each day, it only impacts the panels that, where the shade is occurring, and it leaves all the other ones producing that maximum output. With the traditional single inverter technology, you're going to gang all of the panels together in strings of, say, five to ten panels. And with a, with a string inverter technology, with that type of shadow going across the array, you would have per performance degradation on, on wider bands of the panels because they're, um, because they're daisy chained together. And so there's, there is good modern technology today to deal with some of the shading issues that occur in Maine. We are the most heavily forested state in the nation with 90% with of our land mass covered with trees. So we run into a fair number of situations where we have to make a good decision between uh, lower cost single inverter technology or spending a little extra on, on micro inverters to deal with shading. Um, and if you don't have good sun on your roof, there you can do your solar harvest on the ground. This is a dual axis tracking array. So, um, so that, that device has a GPS tracking system and it wakes up in the morning, it greets the sun as it comes up over the horizon in the east. And then every five minutes it makes a micro adjustment to follow the sun across the sky each day. And seasonally it tilts up and down to, um, to trace the sun as it goes, arcs higher and lower during the seasons. That tracking array um, is rated to give you about 35 to 40 percent more power per year compared to a fixed array. If, if you're curious to see the technology in action, we just put six of these tractors <coughs> down at Maine Audubon in uh, Falmouth. You can just drive right in and go up and check them out. Can you ask a question? What size yeah. is that array right there? Let's see. Twenty-four times three hundred watts. You know, close to eight kilowatts. Yep. The rule of thumb in Maine is um, each single kilowatt of installed capacity, call it roughly four panels, should give you about twelve hundred kilowatt hours of electricity per year. That's the basic rule of thumb. More like eighteen hundred if you're using a tracking array. Um, and Fred did a nice job touching on heat pumps. One thing that uh, we like to point out is that you can see a heat pump here on this uh, Lincolnville Community Library. Um, when, you take, when you take the solar panels and, and compute their electricity output over, say, 25 years, which is the warranty life of the panels, you get a cost per kilowatt hour of somewhere around six or seven cents. 
that's what you're going to pay, which is roughly half of what you would pay for utility power. When you feed seven cents per kilowatt hour solar electricity into a heat pump, where you get the multiplier effect, you get that 300% efficiency, you get home or office heating at the cost equivalent of paying 89 cents a gallon for oil. So it's really a powerful economic uh, opportunity to marry solar panels with hyper-efficient technology like heat pumps. And that goes for both air source heat pumps to, um, to do heating and cooling, as well as the, uh, the heat pumps to make hot water, as Fred was talking about earlier. Um, and, and since this is a nonprofit project, I just wanted to mention briefly that Revision Energy has a program for nonprofits and municipalities where we will finance the installation at zero up upfront cost to the organization. And then we, um, we offer a payment plan to kind of recoup those costs over a fixed time span. So that's a way for um, organizations who can't access the 30% tax credit, we can help them get solar energy in a cost-effective way. It usually works out to paying about, about 60 cents on a dollar for solar for the nonprofit. So another um, aspect of our business is putting in solar electric systems to charge electric vehicles. And we're really excited about what we see happening with electric vehicles. The way I talk about it is if you, if you go back 15 years ago, seeing a Prius was kind of like seeing an elephant. There, there just weren't that many of them. Today you drive around, every other car you see is a Prius. And that that's what's quietly happening behind the scenes with electric vehicles. Uh, this is the, uh, these are the national sales growth fig figures for electric cars. If you have a business where you, people come and, and park at your place of business, I really encourage you to think about an electric vehicle charging station because you will att automatically attract all these people who are investing in electric cars. Um, this is our, uh, we, we call this our decarbonization facility down in Portland. Uh, everybody's invited to come Monday through Friday between 9 and 5. Um, you're welcome to come visit. We have two solar electric systems, a solar hot water system, two heat pumps, a uh, pellet boiler, and as you can see there, we've got solar electric vehicle charging. Um, and what's really cool uh, from our standpoint is that ever since we put in our ch two charging stations, we've been having all these visitors come from Connecticut and Massachusetts, Vermont and New Hampshire because they want to stop in and charge their electric vehicles. So if you want to attract people to your place of business, these charging stations are a great tool. Um, when you put the charging station in, the location gets lo uploaded to a global satellite da database. And as the electric cars run down on juice, they automatically go find the charging stations through the global satellite hookup. And so they, they come to your place of business. It's 142 Presumpscot Street in Portland down by the Department of Motor Vehicles. Yeah. And it's- Is that a stage one or a stage two? That's a, that's a stage two. Um, that one there is made by General Electric. And I kind of like the fact that they're, those are built right in Auburn, Maine. Kind of nice little uh, feature. That kind there has the ability to be locked out with a swipe card. And you could charge people with a credit card if you wanted to. For parking. For, for, for charging. In the state of Maine, you can't charge for, for that, right? Now. Not yet. That's in, in, it's before the legislature right now. But no. you could you could do that. It's yeah, not. That's what a lot of, yeah, my that, town has it, and we can't charge. So right. That, uh, so I have no charging mechanism enabled. People just pull up and use it for free. But that has the ability. It has the capability. Add, you can add it in later. Yeah. How much does that unit cost? That one's 5000 but a basic unit installed typically runs between, between say, 1,200 and 2,000, depending on the co complexity of the installation. You know, the, the least cost install is to hang them on the side of the building. Here we had to dig up some asphalt and pour some concrete, so it costs more to do this one. And it co this one costs more because of those charging capabilities if you want to use them. Most of the units going in today are just hang them on the exterior of the building, and it's a conduit for electricity. It doesn't give you any control over it. Yeah, they run about four to five hundred. You can get them on. You you can get the unit itself online for five hundred to six hundred. 
And there's our little Nissan Leaf. Um, Adam Lee, Lee Auto and Lee Nissan and Topsum just bought five of these. He's got used ones going for 12 or 13 grand a pop if anybody's looking for a Leaf. The lease is 268 a month. Another quick um, data point on the economics. Um, when you crunch the numbers to figure out how much it costs per mile to drive this car, car, you're talking somewhere around three, three and a half cents per mile to drive that electric vehicle about 15 cents a mile for a comparable gas-powered vehicle. Phenomenal um, economics, and you can't beat the, uh, the zero carbon pollution. Um, <laughs> this is just a, a, a slide I stuck in here because you know how I was talking about Maine having the highest per capita carbon pollution in New England? I think that's not only a threat to our tourism industry, but we also have these marine fisheries industries that are so important to us. Maine's $56 million a year clamming industry is already getting impacted by ocean acidification from all these carbon molecules in the atmosphere. I think, I'm thinking to myself, why doesn't Maine create the Tesla of boats, okay? Right, you look at what's happening with those electric vehicle sales figures. We've got a 100-year shipbuilding history in Maine, and we're rolling thousands of pleasure craft and, and marine boats out on the water every day, burning gasoline and, and diesel. Um, I think this is a great opportunity for our state to kind of uh, solve the problem while also creating new industry and new jobs. Is that the same thing that they're using on buses and stuff on the roof? I don't know. I bet GP Cog knows more than I do on that. Well, they did one on that. That's why. That's right. Yeah. Um, and here's a good example of a lobsterman who's, uh, who's concerned about that ocean acidification. This is uh, Jim Merriman. He runs um, a lobster business down in Harpswell, and he's going to be ready for that first electric lobster boat to roll up. And this is my last slide. Um, it's really a breakdown of the known abundance of energy sources to humankind. On the right-hand column, you've got the finite fossil fuels left in the ground. And on the left-hand columns, you're seeing all the renewable options. And I think it's, you know, as you, as Humankind thinks about where to make, his, make its early in investments in renewables. Um, the big yellow resource seems like a pretty good one to think about. And I'm happy to answer any questions if people have them. I, I yeah. Yep. Um, when I mentioned uh, the cost has dropped yep. uh, 75% or so, in, in, in what does it run per kilowatt nowadays? Installed, um, you know, res residential systems are going in for say 3,300 per kilowatt, or three 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 dollars and thirty cents a watt is tip. Yeah, is typically how you talk about it, and then from there you're going up based on you know is it a complicated roof? Um, if you're going on the ground, you're more like four plus per watt. Um, so you get adders up from that point. You can get down below three dollars a watt when you start doing, you know, hundred kilowatts and more. Also, you had um, you had mentioned that four panels um, in Maine produces roughly twelve hundred kilowatts. Yeah, uh, in the rule of thumb is one kilowatt of capacity equals roughly twelve hundred kilowatt hours of electricity per year, yeah. assuming a good orientation and a and a decent pitch. The rule of thumb on the angle of your solar panels is you approximate your latitude. So ideal for Maine is somewhere between 40 and 45 degrees for an angle of incidence. Now what are you using for solar panels and what are their efficiencies? What wattage solar panels in that example? We're installing a lot of uh, 280 to 300 watt okay. panels. Sorry. Yeah, efficiency is, you know, let's call it on average 17 to 18%. On your uh, hot water panels, you're using all flat plate panels instead of a yep. vacuum tube. Yeah. Uh, and that's on a per project basis, which technology you might se se select. Um, on that hotel in Old Orchard Beach, where you're going to have maximum uh, consumption in the summertime, a flat plate collector does better than an evacuated tube collector during the summer months. And so a flat plate makes a lot more sense. If you have more of a year-round, even distribution of load, you might be looking at evacuated tubes. And how about uh, uh, hail and 
things like that on a, on a flat plate where if you have an evacuated tube and break down tube, you can replace it. You know, they're, they're both rated to one inch hail. And after 10 years and, and a few thousand systems deployed, we have not yet seen one shatter from hail. Um, rocks have done it. <laughs> you know, a rock, a big enough tree branch will do it, but it, it really, a golf ball has done it. <laughs> but it, it just hasn't, hasn't been a, a factor. Yeah. Go ahead, Christina. Yeah, yeah we have time. Um, I, I'm just curious. I, um, I'm aware that climate change is causing more rainfall in the Northeast as well as probably more cloud cover. Is that affecting all these uh, comparisons <coughs> you're making with the, the solar resource here? I don't know. Um, the <coughs> the data that I was showing was based on 30-year records from NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And so how much they can factor in kind of the evolving conditions today, I don't know. You can get a sunburn worse on a, rain, on a cloudy day than you can on a sunny day. I was going to say, what, what's the efficiency of a cloudy day with solar panels? You know, it's a sliding yeah. scale. Okay. How, is, it, is it just How a... thick of the clouds? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. If it's, yeah. you know, thick, dark sure. thunderheads, you're, you know, you're down near zero. If it's a, just a light haze, you know, you've only pinched it down a little bit. So, sliding scale. Yeah. Question about location in winter. Um, you showed a slide of Oakhurst Dairy. And yeah. It looked like a fairly flat roof. Yeah. You get a foot of snow, what happens? You get a foot of snow. <laughs> <laughs> on that flat roof. Yeah, you... yeah. In, unless somebody's really motivated and clears them off, they you give up you give up a few weeks of production in say February. Um, the counterbalance to that is, you know, those few weeks of solar irradiation in February are a pretty tiny fraction of the annual solar resource. So you haven't given up a ton of value. The other thing you want to think about is, OK, with that flat roof, you've now optimized the array for summertime production. When the sun is high, that, that array is cranking. Come winter, when the sun is low, it's not doing a whole bunch for you anyway. And so if you lose a few days from snow, and you already banged not, your record. Yeah. So, it, what if you lose a few months? Well, most, yeah, most it's not good. Happened. Not good. Yeah, it's not good. That you know, you work with you you work with yeah, you clean them off. You work with what you have. You know, if they had a nice forty-five degree angle roof there, that would have been a better opportunity. But they had a you know nearly flat roof, and that's where we get it. Yeah. Let's yeah. take one more question. Then yeah. on another slide, you showed a really <coughs> steep array. Yeah. And it looked like it had a snow break underneath, does it act like a metal roof? It, it, it sheds the snow heat. very rapidly. Yeah, because it's a... heat up, so if you have a steeper roof, you would have less loss of that time of year. Absolutely. And remember, the rule of thumb is to approximate your latitude. And so two. 40 to 45 degrees is ideal. And one follow-up question, if you have an asphalt roof, yeah. asphalt roof for 25, 30 years, yeah. you're so recommending new roof before you put on your... If the roof is 10 years old or younger and in decent shape, we say you're, you're fine. Go ahead and, sh and put the array over it. You're going to protect that roof anyway. No rays, you're going to take all the UV, all the precipitation. It's just going to get a little moisture behind it. Um, if the roof is 10 years old and older and getting a little long in the tooth, now we're recommending that, that you re-roof it. Thank you. You're welcome. Have you had any problem with losing uh, panels because of snow flooding in the last time on a steel roof? One this year, first year in 10 years. And we moved the other. We, we basically took the one that was underneath and said, that's not viable. We just put it on a different roof. It's the first time that ever happened. Now, you put in Dayton system. Yep. Now, th that was what, six years ago? Something like that? How, how long has it, they're just about what, paid off on that now? Sounds right. Yeah, I don't have the numbers in my head. Well, if you guys haven't gone to see Dayton, go see it. The town hall, they built it. Uh, yeah, we did Wind Windham recently. Yeah. Great. All right. Great. Thank you very much. You're Bill. welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks.
So next we have a, uh, a little change to the agenda. Uh, Jacob Robertson from Interphase Energy is not uh, able to join us today. But we do have Lee here, and I think he'll be able to uh, cover the gamut when it comes to uh, renewable biomass uh, pellet and chip heating. Thank you. Um, I've been at this uh, since uh, 2006. Um, I first met, um, um, back then it was Energy Works, and um, now they're Revision Energy. And I started doing wood boilers um, specifically for them. Um, back in 2009, um, we realized um, that the landscape of biomass was changing drastically and um, that we needed to adapt um, to answer uh, what, we, what we figured was going to be a growing demand for biomass heating systems. Um, so uh, from that was born Revision Heat. Uh, Revision Heat is uh, Maine's first renewable energy mechanical contractor. Uh, we do not and will not and have not ever installed an oil boiler and we're still around. Um, that's, um, that's something that not a lot of contractors that are in heating in Maine can say. We, we've got quite a dependency on fossil fuel. Um, so there is an alternative to um, the finite resources that we've been using for the past 70 years to heat our homes and businesses. And that's what I'm here to talk about. So a little bit about me. Um, like I said, um, we, um, we started Revision Heat in 2009. Um, <clears throat> before that, um, I ran my own business installing heating systems. Um, and, um, and even before that, um, worked with my father um, as a youngster as he was doing the same thing as I was growing up and um, he had in, he had uh, introduced me to um, optimizing the output of boilers to match um, the housing that the that the system supported um, because the main the main reason um, was because these things are binary that they're either off or on at full blast and uh, full blast was um, usually more than the house needed on 100% of the days um, uh, designed for um, what they call design day heat load. And uh, on any other day than design day, it was oversized. Um, so we started, uh, we started doing a lot of things to manage that and to improve that even back in my childhood. Um, so it's no surprise that I'm sitting here today. I've been doing this for a very long time, holding the flashlight for dad and, and then, and then uh, carrying the torch after he retired. So there's a myth uh, that, uh, that biomass, and especially woody biomass, is an alternative energy. Um, and there's really only two kinds of energy. There's um, fossil or finite resources and uh, renewable resources that we can use for, for heating and for energy. And the reality is that um, we are heavily dependent on non-renewable sources of heat and energy. Which means we export a lot of money. The reality is that Maine is the most heavily forested state in the United States. Um, there is wood everywhere. Um, if we were in Iowa, I'd be talking about using corn to heat our homes. Um, but we live here, and um, this beautiful landscape is just um, ripe with uh, the fuel resource we need to stay warm in the wintertime. Another reality is that the renewable energy uh, in Maine is a huge opportunity um, for, uh, for a local business, um, and that opportunity is enormous. <coughs> I 
enter the mighty wood pellet. Um, the, the systems that are available today are, um, are, s are so much more uh, efficient, reliable, and automated than systems that were even available five years ago. Um, the infrastructure is building up around um, wood pellets in a way that uh, is, is unprecedented. Um, we currently have five um, mills and two, two delivery services um, in this area that service this area. Um, soon to be a third, I think that uh, uh, there's another wood pellet um, uh, production <coughs> production and storage facility uh, earmarked for this this vicinity. So these trucks are going to start showing up more and more. You're going to see them around a lot more. Um, main energy systems in Bethel has four of them. They're talking about a fifth. Um, Tim Hoots out of uh, Lewiston, Hoots Premium Pellets, um, just added another truck. Um, and, and every day and every week, Revision Heat, uh, and that's just one company, uh, we're installing one uh, wood pellet fired heating system for a home or business. Um, to help transition folks off of fossil fuel. And we're doing an average of one a week. We're hoping to grow that to two. So what we're installing is not your grandfather's wood boiler. These things are super automated. They're, um, they're self-cleaning. Um, I shouldn't say self-cleaning, they're self-de-ashing. Um, where, you know, uh, whenever you Whenever you burn anything, there's a byproduct of combustion. And uh, wood fuel is a not a very dense fuel. So you have to burn more of it to get the same energy, so there's a lot more byproducts of combustion. So those byproducts include fly ash and, uh, and uh, you know, CO2. Uh, but the CO2 that produces, pr produced during the combustion process is the same CO2 that would be released from the wood if it decayed naturally. So. Uh, we're not uh, we're not burning sequestered carbon here. Um, this is um, this is another example of why these boilers aren't your grandfather's wood boiler. This is this is the uh, online um, dashboard of uh, your typical wood pellet uh, boiler that we install. Um, I can access any one or all of our boilers online. Um, and make changes to parameters, uh, clear alarms, um, track usage data, and track performance. If you, um, if, you, uh, if you have one of these boilers in your basement, you can have this same sort of dashboard on your laptop. Um, there is even a telephone app, um, so you could take it with you. Um, I've actually gone away for the weekend, turned my boiler off, and then on the trip back down, logged in, turned the boiler on, and had the house warm by the time I got there. Um, you'll notice that um, on the right-hand side, um, right in the hopper, uh, right on that hopper icon, it shows how much is in the hopper, how much uh, the person or the heating system used <coughs> a day, and, um, and it also, above that, there's a graphical display that if you click on, it'll actually show you how many pellets you used in a day for the last 24 days, the past uh, 12 months. So you can track usage based on, um, based on uh, actual data. Um, it uses a, a calculation to figure it all out. Um, I'm not gonna go into the nitty gritties of it, but suffice it to say that this thing's pretty smart and pretty capable and um, and the most important thing, I think, it's um, it's got a ten to one turn down, which um, people usually wonder what that means. Is that it's not on at one hundred percent or off. Um, it comes on at a low percentage, uh, ten or fifteen percent, and then ramps up based on demand. Um, so if um, if it's really cold outside, it may ramp up to one hundred percent, but on the average day, it may not run over thirty or forty percent at peak. <laughs> Um, how much room does a unit like that require? Um, not much more than an oil boiler for the equipment itself. Um, silage takes up a little more space. Like I said, pellets aren't as dense a fuel as oil, um, so it takes a little bit more room to uh, hold uh, a month or so's worth of fuel. Um, I've got a three-ton hopper, 
that I filled at my home home uh, three times this past winter. It takes up about an eight uh, eight foot square uh, space in my basement, um, which is marginally more space than two oil tanks would take up. And I've had about the same amount of deliveries as somebody would have those sorts of uh, fuel tanks in their basement. So. Um, what we're saying by 90% CO2 reduction is that uh, the, the combustion <coughs> process itself is, is carbon neutral, meaning that carbon was going to be produced anyway. Um, but the 10% comes from the harvest and uh, production of wood pellets. This is, uh, this is a hijacked uh, presentation. I usually, uh, mine is a little more nuts and bolts about how these systems work. Um, one thing I would say is that if, um, if you have a business and, uh, and you're contemplating uh, doing things to, um, to save money and to improve the value of your business over the next five to ten years, um, thinking about how you create your, your energy and, and how you use energy and how, um, how you heat your space is, uh, or your, your uh, process, um, what have you, is uh, very important. Um, there are um, there are options as far as getting into it. Um, you know, uh, there's power purchase for solar. Um, Biomass is finally um, working on a program similar to that, and that there is a company out there uh, uh, called Pelico. There's a representative here from those folks that they actually lease heating systems um, to businesses and nonprofits. Uh, basically, uh, for no upfront cost, you get an installation of one of these biomass systems and you enjoy the savings of, um, of having a biomass system and you pay for it incrementally along the way. Um, I think it's a great option for, uh, for a company or an entity that wanted to um, get off oil and save, uh, save these finite resources and to, and to do it without having to come out of pocket with a huge expense of having to pay for one of these system <coughs> installations. Anybody have any questions? Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay, I've, I've got a question. I've got a uh, pellet boiler mm -hmm. in a uh, in a enclosed room, and the room heats up a little bit. I've got a super store in there. Would it be more efficient for me to have one of these super efficient hot water heaters that runs off electricity and uses the heat in the in the room, or is it better to have the super store running off the pellet boiler? I'm confused. Well. Um, <laughs> I can tell you from personal experience because that's, that's exactly the setup I have. Um, when I ran the, the numbers against having an indirect uh, fire water heater powered by the pellet boiler uh, versus having a heat pump water heater sitting right next to my uh, pellet boiler using that latent heat to, to create the energy needed to heat my water, it was no comparison. Um, the heat pump water heater hands down. It's the cheapest way to make hot water. Oh, okay. With some PV. Well, yeah, <laughs> PV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Should also insulate. That's yeah. <laughs> usually a big thing that you go into boiler rooms and they're not insulated. Yeah. Yeah. Small ones. Got a question? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh. It's oh, oh, yeah. are your systems retrofitted, or, or are they brand new installs? We can retrofit any system that's out there, uh, except for uh, single pipe steam. We have a little bit of issue with that. We'd like to. Uh, get you off of steam because it's not a horribly efficient way to make heat. Um, and these boilers aren't steam generators, so they're, they're hot, hot water boilers. But any other system um, we can work with. So you just basically replaced the burner? Um, we replaced the, the boiler uh, system. So um, the, the pellet boiler is, uh, is a package system with the, the burner, the vessel, and all the controls. Thank you. Can I ask, how much is the price per ton delivered? Um, I paid about two fifty a ton uh, two weeks ago. Oh, so you still have full. You, you filled it three times, but you're full now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I used about two uh, two uh, bags full, or about six tons of pellets, to heat my home for the winter. Right. Cost so, less than two thousand dollars. So my concern isn't so much the technology of the boilers. I think they're great, but uh, up in our neck of the woods, at least there's been issues covering when they're getting the supply. Yeah. Mm. On the supply side. Right, yeah, there, there, was, um, there was definitely a perceived shortage in wood pellets, and I think that that was kind of um, 
it was perpetrated by the big box stores and kind of perpetuated by the media. And but the the reality was that uh, there wasn't a shortage at all. There was a, a supply chain um, glitch caused by um, the the big box stores putting in big orders in the middle of the winter time, um, causing the small local producers to um, to have to wait in line behind a big thousand ton order uh, from the Home Depots or the or the, the uh, tractor supply store. Um, so your Abishans were running out of pellets, and of course your Home Depots and your um, your tractor supplies were running out because they didn't plan, plan properly uh, early on. And, um, bagged and those are bagged pellets, yeah. So the difference between um, bag pellets and, and bulk pellets is that um, there is a facility, you know, at, at every uh, loading facility, uh, the machine can either put pellets here or it can easily shift to put pellets here, which, uh, you know, they back a truck under it, fill it with pellets and they go away and then they go back to putting it in bags. Um, so very easy for um, bulk pellet producers and bulk pellet uh, delivery folks to get all the pellets they need. Um, Tim Hoots has a storage facility in Lewiston. It's uh, 300 tons, so uh, he, was never, uh, he was never even close to being uh, in short supply. And how many of these delivery truck systems are in this area, and how rural do they deliver? Mm -hmm. um, they will deliver anywhere within Maine. Um, as you get further south into York County, it gets a little more expensive, uh, but not any less available. Um, Maine Energy Systems has four trucks. Uh, Tim Hutz has two, and they'll. they'll uh, Tim Hutz is pretty much Augusta area south. Uh, Maine Energy Systems, <coughs> they're they're statewide. Um, I believe there's uh, there's a couple in Arista County even. Uh, Daigle Oil has one, and there's so another one. So they deliver out this far far and up into Oxford also County. Yep, uh, I've got systems um, all the way. Uh, I've got one in Casco. I've got one in here in Raymond. I've got uh, some in Gorham. I've even got some in um, uh, Bridgeton. So we've got them everywhere. Steep Falls. I mean, we you talk to the Bridgeton Town Hall. They need a new boiler. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write that down. <laughs> They're talking about money on the issues on it now. <laughs> um, so is there any other questions? I believe you had one in the back. No, my question is on the supply side. It sounds to me like a bulk system's a way to go on a hard bank system. Yeah, um, you know, the, the efficiency marine rebate for, for, uh, for wood pellet boilers, um, there's two stipulations, whether, uh, whether you have it tied with an existing system in parallel or if you've taken out your uh, existing fossil fuel system completely and done uh, full-on conversion to wood pellets. Both are possible with these systems. Um, I would say that uh, uh, the efficiency main rebate is available for both projects, 30% up to $5,000, which is certainly nothing to sneeze at. Um, but with the, the bag-fed parallel program, you can definitely lower the barrier entry <coughs> substantially um, to something to the uh, neighborhood of nine or ten thousand uh, dollars for a simple bag-fed pellet boiler installation, and you still are eligible for that uh, for thirty percent uh, rebate. So that's an after rebate cost. So, so you're in the business. You have been for a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I look at wood as being finite, even though it's renewable. <coughs> you can outpace usable wood if the supply just continues to grow. Mm -hmm. Right. Any concerns? Um, we're not concerned at this point. Uh, you know, there was a study done. Um, the the governor's office of energy independence uh, commissioned a report um, on the viability of the of the woody biomass uh, availability or the the viability of woody biomass. Um, so the question was asked: um, How many uh, main homes can uh, convert to uh, biomass? Uh, before it starts adversely affecting our wood resource, and that answer was 10%. Um, and as of as of today, uh, we are barely touching 2%. So, we've got a ways to go. Is there a, is there a large variation in, in quality of pellets? You need to know what you're looking for, basically. Well, um, quality of pellets um, used to be, uh, you know, uh, quite a big. Um, factor in, in these systems. Um, more and more these systems are coming here with, um, with onboard technology that actually compensates for fuel flowering. Um, we can't do anything about durability of pellets, um, but 
the quality of, uh, of combustion is actually very well controlled. Um, when I say quality or uh, durability of pellets, you know, sometimes when the truck comes to deliver, um, the pellets arrive in, in such small pieces that, um, that they create uh, dust in the bag. And, and those are, uh, you know, those, those issues are, um, are there, but they're not very common. Um, I think we've got about 150 systems um, in the field operating, and we have a handful uh, each year of issues with fines, pellet fines. So um, the boilers react very well, or they adapt very well to fuel quality, um, and the systems are getting better at conveying um, pellets that aren't as durable as they should be. And the mills are actually getting better <coughs> at creating a pellet that is more durable. So, so you, um, these pellet stoves are all dual fuel. You can burn corn in most of them, correct? Uh, no. Uh, the pellet boilers that we're installing are, are, um, are listed for use with wood pellet fuel only. Um, because I've noticed a lot of them are. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, are we going to convert forest land to corn fields here, and how does that affect your conversion? Boy, I because corn corn grows every year. Tree takes a long time. I hope that we're not cutting down forests to plant corn. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but if you get to twenty percent of the homes, we're going to be out pacing the production of wood. Mm -hmm then we're going to have to do it. And that's my question is in 25 years when people have to start converting to corn, do they have to buy a new boiler or can you convert yours to burn that? I don't see it happening here because we're well forested, but say like um, places that aren't. Well, I think that um the, the burn grate and the mechanics of the, of the burner will convey uh, corn just as easily as they will anything else. Um, the uh, combustion controls are robust enough that they could adapt to corn as a fuel. Um, the only thing I worry about, and it's probably just an engineering question, um, is that what do you do um, with the hard uh, buildup that's sure to happen when you burn something with such a sugar content? <coughs> um, there will be buildup of, right. of some material in the burn chamber um, that will have to be either scraped or somehow agitated so it'll uh, be conveyed out. Um, but uh, as far as anything else, it, it's, not goes, a it's not a huge. It's not a huge. Is this just a hardwood pellet or is this like a softwood and hardwood pellet if they're manufacturing? Um, it's an 80% it's an hardwood pellet. Uh, they use softwood to mix in with the hardwood. Um, to bind the pellet together uh, because there's more uh, lignin is a, is, a, is a commonly occurring uh, uh, what do they call it? It's a Binder. yeah so yeah, com yeah it's it's it, it binds the pellets together um, so they don't use any artificial uh, um, additives to bind the pellets together they just add a little softwood now all things being equal I would burn a softwood pellet a hundred percent softwood pellet in my heating system, um, if I could get them. So um, this is a possibility as for business-wise, where our pulp and paper industries are <coughs> these large mills and large buildings that we're going to be finding empty. That they we could move something like this into those industries. Yeah, in fact, that's what's going on, um, and I think it's Baldwin, um, right near here. So uh, they're using <coughs> a facility that was. Uh, Used for was it? I, I, I'm not even sure. Maybe it was educational or something like that, and converting it into pellet production um, and and storage. Um, and I think that um, I think that as the pulp and paper industry declines, that uh, that pull on the resource is also going to decline. So this report that was commissioned was done um, well before um, the East Millinocket and the Bucksport mills and all the, uh, all the paper mills that have shut in the last three or four years. Um, so I imagine our wood resource uh, for home heating has actually grown um, from what it was five years ago. Thank you, Lee. I really appreciate that. Great presentation. And uh, our next speaker up is Sue Jones from Community Energy. <coughs> 
And she will be talking about the Renewable Energy for America program grants. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. So, how are you all doing today? Need a stretch break for any anybody? <laughs> Feel free to take one if you need to. Um, I'm just being cognizant of the time. Um, I will try to get you out of here by 11, but I can stay till 11:15 sharp if there's any other questions. Um, got another appointment to get to this afternoon. Um, so you've heard some great presentations on very specific types of energy efficiency and renewable energy um, technologies. Now we're going to switch gears to where's the money. <laughs> so. This is, we're going to talk about one of the federal funding programs, which is perfectly suited to small businesses and rural small businesses in Maine and farmers and agricultural producers. Currently, right now, in the state of Maine, we have practically Zippo as far as incentive monies available to us. Let's be clear, that's not likely to change under this administration. So this program, while it is a federal program, may be your best um, bet as far as getting any assistance, um, real dollars assistance, um, towards your renewable energy or energy efficient program. That being said, your timing is good. The, federal, the uh, Farm Bill just passed a year and a half ago. New regulations for this program just came out in February under a brand new, not brand new, but a slightly modified program that makes it a little bit easier for some projects, in my opinion, not all, in my opinion. Um, but your timing is good. This year we have almost $68 million available. That's about three times what we've, the, the highest we've had in the past five or six years. So there's a flush of money available this year and the next few years but you know what's happening in Congress, too. We're not quite sure how long that will last, either. So if you're serious about putting in um, any uh, energy efficiency improvements or renewable energy, think about the timing now. Start planning your project, um, doing your feasibility studies, getting your estimates in place, so that all your program initiatives, so that you will, will be ready to apply. That being said, there are some deadlines. Um, one of which is Thursday. I don't think you can get meet that one, just <laughs> FYI. Um, but that's okay. The next one is June 30th. <coughs> the next one after that is October 30th. But please also know that you can submit any time in between so that if you have something ready to go Friday, feel free to submit it on Friday at any point. In fact, the earlier the better for the staff at USDA and Bangor, um, primarily because they get very, very busy right around those deadlines. So what is this program? I'm going to jump right in. So important key points of this program is applicant eligibility and project eligibility. Very important to focus on these two separate categories. First category is applicant eligibility. Agricultural producers are any individual entity receives 51% or more of your gross income from agricultural production. That is forest, mostly farming, forestry, and fisheries. But it also can be nurseries, dairies. Th think of it very broadly. Anything you cultivate from the land, from the sea, or from the forests, that those all can, can make you um, eligible as an agricultural producer. Um, the smaller the agricultural producer, the better this year because there's extra points. So if you're on the smaller side and you said, oh gosh, this is only for the big guys, think again because you're actually in a better position. And the reason why USDA tries to do that and is doing that this year and has done it in the past years, few years, is they want to spread out the money as far and wide as they can. While they do give large grants up to $500,000 for renewables and $250,000, $250, for energy efficiency, they really love giving out smaller grants because that that's more beneficiaries of these programs. More projects get done. Some of them, most of them smaller, but at least more projects do get done. The other piece is rural small businesses. So the way the federal government um, defines small businesses is typically by a NAICS code or um, defined by the Small Business Administration. That's the NAICS codes. So it's very important that you figure out what your business does as it relates to that NAICS code, because you have to file with a NAICS code. Um, a NAICS code is 
let me think of this. It's sort of an industrial classification system. IRS uses it. The we're sort of, a lot of federal agencies use this and then they, they track what, what industries are getting more federal funding and that type of thing. So it's very important. Now, if the most obvious NAICS code you find um, you, you actually end up don't qualifying. A NAICS code also is in, in um, conjunction with, in some cases, not all, annual um, receipts, business receipts, plus number of employees. Um, so if, for instance, you're like, gosh, I have too many employees, I make too much money per year, God knows in Maine, but <laughs> if that happens, think very creative whether you might fit into a different NAICS code that's equally applicable or maybe slightly less applicable, because that may give you some latitude as far as retaining your eligibility for the program. So that's 50, is that population? So what that means in, as that as that is applied in Maine is, <coughs> unless you're in Portland, you're gonna qualify. So, oh, that's Maine. yeah, and even parts of Portland actually do qualify. So it's very important. There is a website, um, actually I have a handout. I'm going to pass that around too. Um, there is a website right on USDA's, um, I have the website right here, that you can plug in your address. No, thank you. And it will pinpoint whether you, and it will tell you, you are an eligible location. That goes to project <laughs> eligibility um, as well, and so we'll, we'll get to that point. But um, that will help you as you define whether you're eligible. So. On the energy efficiency side, probably everything that you heard about today is going to be eligible. From light bulbs, to your heating system, to your cooling system, ventilation fans, automated controls, insulation, even some appliances can be um, eligible. So if you've got a new building going in, or you're just doing certain upgrades to a building, um, most things that which qualify um, as energy efficiency under the state regulations as well also qualify um, for federal. So this is an interesting point. If your business, and, and in, in this context all agricultural producers, all farms are businesses, a little bit of redundancy there, is qualifying for any efficiency main upgrades, any rebates, any customized incentives, you will likely also um, qualify for this. So it's an additive rebate program. I always suggest you go for the non-competitive um, state, if there's state funding available or state incentives on the efficiency side, go for those first. I should have clarified, when I said there's no state funding, I meant no renewable energy funding. There still is some energy efficiency funding. Right, Bill? There's still some energy efficiency mm -hmm. <laughs> that <Yeah>. hasn't been <laughs> diminished at this point. Thank God. Um, so always go for your state funding first because that's non-competitive. You will get it um, as long as you meet the very generous requires of our, requirements of our state. On the renewable side, just your typical, your, uh, your typical rene renewable energy technologies, solar, wind, small hydroelectric. Interestingly, small hydroelectric under this federal program is defined as under 30 megawatts. That's a pretty big one to me. <laughs> um, I don't know about you, but that's huge. Um, anaerobic digesters, biomass. Biomass is very broadly defined from wood pellet um, boilers to wood pellet processing plants to um, some types of composting. Um, very broad, very broad on the biomass stuff. Geothermal and wave and ocean power is relatively new. Any questions so far? Uh, when you said businesses, uh, efficiency main said a business, uh, they define business as anything basically where you don't have your address. Is that how you define businesses? Like a, 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 a hotel is a business, but an apartment house wouldn't be a business? Interesting. Um, that There may be a slight difference in um, definitions there, so you'd need to double check. Um, the business definition under the federal requirements, um, it's interesting because they do, it can't be residential, um, it has to be a business, but as long as you have a NAICS code 
you um, can show your annual receipts through a tax return, a federal tax return for that business, um, you should be fine. Just make sure, the easiest way to look at it is look at what the application requires you to submit as a business on the federal side. And if you can meet all those requirements, you are generally, you're in good shape. You can always run it by USDA just as a, hey, what if, want to check this first before I do the whole application, and they're happy to do that. They're very generous at this point. Sue, quick question for yeah. you. Yeah. Um, on the previous slide, does co-generation fall in line with either of those? I believe it does. Um, it used, I can honestly say it used to because I've done um, a co-generation um, application before that got funded. So I know it used to be. I'm pretty sure it is now. Um, but I can double check on the Rex if you want. It's pretty, biomass is really broad. And your aquaculture, is that on those or our, like, our small? Sure, it's a business. Um, there's yep. a lot, I mean, the state owns a lot of fisheries. Are they eligible to get help with stuff like that? It's, it really goes back to whether the state can has an affiliated business. Um, the state itself is not. But if the state creates a business, a separate <coughs> LLC, um, to run that, then that may qualify. It really kind of depends on the details of how they're s legally structured. Yeah, just some of us small towns have a lot of those that we really rely on for our fishing industry to bring Right, right. So, eligible project costs and in ineligible. Um, pretty much this is <coughs> primarily for um, equipment, whatever equipment. So on, the, so on the renewable energy side, it's pretty clear. Wind turbines, what would be, you know, eligible would be the turbine, the foundation, the blades, everything to make it operational. It gets a little tricky when you start talking about, say, a wood pellet mill, because there's lots of pieces to a wood pellet mill. But literally, everything from the hoppers to the, um, not the escalators, the conveyor belts, <laughs> to the, um, and the heaters, the dryers, the, um, and so on. Everything you need to make that work. So think of it pretty broadly. But if there's any questions, always go to USA, USDA and double check. Um, USDA prefers um, new equipment, but they will also take some refurbished equipment. Um, the retrofitting of a building, that's mostly energy efficient stuff. For your professional service fees, your consultants for feasibility studies, for the technical work, all of that can be included um, in your project costs. And then um, working capital land acquisition is restricted to guaranteed loans. So unless that typically doesn't happen. On the ineligible side, anything <coughs> residential, no, no. Um, farm tillage equipment, used equipment, and vehicles, those um, are typically not, not typically, they are not eligible for funding. <coughs> so a um, forklift, not eligible. Um, anything you do prior to submitting your application, anything you pay for, is not eligible. So here's your strategy. You're ready to submit the application on a Friday. Pay your bills on Saturday, okay? Include all of that in there, but do not um, put, you know, make sure the timing is right and then um, make sure anything you prepare. Now you can't, any, app, any grant writer fees are not ever at any point in the, situ in the timeline um, eligible. You cannot ask for a line of credit, you cannot pay lease payments, and you cannot um, have any payments to yourself um, <coughs> or anyone affiliated in your business. <coughs> so, pretty clear, typical conflict of interest type stuff. Is it actually free application or is it free notice of award for spending money? For, for no, it's application, it's based so, on submission. So even, even if you, I mean, you don't have a clue whether you're gonna get it or not, you could start purchasing after you apply? Yes, and yes. If you're on, say for instance, you are on a timeline, you have um, some conditions, you have to get it in. You know, you're, this is competitive, so you're taking a chance whether you're gonna get the grant or not, but you can submit, um, you can accumulate work. Um, you can, I should clarify this a little bit more. You should have, you can accumulate work but you can't, and then you can include it in your application, but you can't 
you can't get you can't pay them ahead of time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, so it's really in the time. Things like in kind matching and things like that. Is that? No. Oh. No. None of you, that. Even if it's no. your own work, even. No, 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 no. No, no you no payments to yourself. All right. No payments to yourself. I um just to clarify, in my my understanding is that you need a notice of completion from USDA on your application before you can incur those project eligible costs. So it's not just the submission of the application, but there's the initial review, a notice of completion, then you are free and clear to go. Completion of the application. Exactly. Yes, that's so correct. So it's not just put it in the mail and start right. spending. Right, that's true. That is a good point. That is a good point because I'm assuming what you submit on that day is complete. Yes, sir. So you're taking the risk that it's not, if it's not complete, you're going to run into the risk of what she's talking about. You are correct. Yeah, it is a completed application. But I was making the assumption that you all would submit a complete application. Okay, 25% of your total project costs. Different uh, limits depending on renewable energy versus energy efficiency. Minimum 2,500, mm -hmm. maximum 500,000 for renewable energy. Um, and then a minimum of 1,500 and 250,000 on energy efficiency. Um, on the loan side, up to 75%. This is a big difference. Um, so you can get 75% of your project um, financed through the Guaranteed Loan Program. Minimum of 5,000, total maximum of 25 million. So you have to have a willing lender. <coughs> Most banks in Maine, I'm, I'm sorry to say, are not that familiar with this particular program yet. So you kind of have to walk them through the program um, farm Credit, I think, has been um, one of the better ones to work with. They are familiar. I've done work with them. But most of the banks are just really learning about it. I don't know why this program's been around for almost 20 years. So it's unfortunate. Um, I'm going to, 30, April 30th is going to come and go on Thursday. Um, set your sights on the next deadline, which is June 30th, <coughs> the October 30th deadline. So what they're doing a little bit this year is they're sort of um, um, prioritizing, not prioritizing, but they're um, segregating it a little bit differently than how they've done in the past. And every year in the past was a little bit different <coughs> anyway. Um, but for instance, right now for April 30th, there is a set aside for very small grants of under $20,000. You can submit something larger. But there's actually a preference. There's actually a priority for funding those smaller projects. Um, that um, you can also submit um, additional ones in, in June 30th, but that set aside will no longer be there. Um, and then you have to, you know, there's minimum scores as far as guaranteed loans. Most people don't do loans, um, I think, because of the hassle factor, but it's worth looking into. So here are just some examples. I know it is now um, 11, and I'll go quickly <coughs> through these. Um, this is a chicken farm. Um, I don't know where this is, but um, they put in radiant heat, fans, vents, and computerized controls. Total project cost of 100,000. They did not go for the full 25,000. Do you see where they put in at 20 to get the extra points? Or they were trying to get a priority score. Something to think about strategically. If that $5,000 is not a huge deal, and in most cases on a $100,000 <coughs> project it's not, sometimes it can really give you an advantage to go to, to request less money so you get more points. Um, they did this again, look at the numbers. $150,000 total project cost, they only went for 20. Um, that's all they needed, and they increased their score um, by doing that. 30 to 40% reduction in operating costs. Laundry mats, dry cleaners, um, they went for about 25%. They got dealer financing. If you're in a franchise, think about that. That might be um, available to you and might be easier for you to get, maybe at lower interest rates. 52% energy um, financing. Um, dairy farmers, um, this is an anaerobic digester. So they're really creating a new business using the waste products from an existing business. Um, digesters are tough 
complicated applications, but we do have, we have one in Maine that has been funded and numerous in Vermont that have been funded. Um, they're just really expensive projects, um, but if you know anything about them already, you already know that. <laughs> so, um, they're used a lot in Europe. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully some of those European models will come our way, which are um, smaller. Um, nurseries, landscaping, um, glass roofs, radiant heat, fans, vents, larger project here, 25%, uh, and then a commercial loan. So something to think about there. Auto repair shops. Um, you know, this is an interesting, micro hydro is something um, really hasn't come to Maine yet. I know there's some folks in Vermont doing it. Um, but something to think about. I don't really know this technology all that well, um, but nonetheless, it appears to be um, very efficient. Rural manufacturing, all they did was lighting. They took a simple, that's a simple project, a simpler project. Or a grocery store, just doing cooler doors. Simpler project. Grocery store, uh, geothermal heat, coolers, lighting, went for the 25%, big overall change in energy costs. Flowers gift shop, same thing, <coughs> think broadly. And so you can do your own applications, I can help you with applications, um, you know, it's up to you how, if and when you want to do that, but know that you have resources available um, to do that. I actually have funding through USDA to help um, with applications, I cannot do the whole thing for you, but we can do some cost share. Um, we can submit applications at any time of the year, and um, it, de it depends. Your application will compete with the group with the next deadline. So if you, the next deadline you're aiming for within is um, June 30th, everything submitted, anything not funded out of the April <coughs> um, cycle, may or may not, if, if, if the applicant wishes, it will get rolled over and then combined with anything received between April 30th and June 30th, and those will compete for that round. And then I'm happy to answer any other questions. Um, I just saw with the grocery stores, you had an IPA up there. And I've looked through the, uh, the uh, small business category, yeah. kind of the number of employees or gross revenue numbers. Right. It seems like an IPA would be would exceed those numbers. So this is really interesting. When you think of small rural small businesses or just small businesses, you think like I think, which is an IGA should not qualify. But let me tell you, they do. And in fact, pulp and paper mills in Maine qualify. So I would never in my generalized thinking think that they would. I've only had one applicant that's never that didn't qualify and it happened to be a car dealership that made too much money. And we could not figure out another NAICS code that they would qualify. Um, so think broadly, an IGA, I don't know if it, Hannaford might be too big, but some of these, definitely the smaller mom and pop stores will qualify. So the, the car dealership is a cumulative for a dozen locations, that's one income? Typically, yeah, it depends on how, um, <coughs> yeah, there is some, there's some changes in the eligibility on that, but typically, yes. They didn't want to have gaming such that, you know, Jolly John's or something um, with multiple places um, started parsing off, you know, their smaller, smallest location and then became eligible. So it, it's really in the details, and I'm not exactly sure. Without your contact information? Um, I have some cards I'm happy to pass okay. around. Sorry, there's a piece of fuzz. Oh, maybe that's a stamp. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? I know it's been a long morning for you, um, but lots of information, and I'm happy to answer any other questions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all very much for attending this morning, nearly afternoon. Um, and again, if you have any other questions, uh, I think several of us will continue to be here for a little while before we take off. Uh, and again, thank you to the town of Redmond, uh, Raymond for hosting uh, and having us here, and also to Chief Cog. Thank you. Thank you.